From a community born out of principles of utopian socialism, biblical communism, and so, so much sex between any and all members ages 14 and older, and probably younger than 14 sometimes, one of the largest 20th century flatware and fine cutlery companies in the world was born. Uh Uh-huh. That's where we're at this week. Community founder John Humphrey Noyes was an odd duck to say the least. He seemed to truly believe that lots and lots of sex could literally lead to immortality. And he was so passionate about this belief that he convinced over 300 people to join him in a utopian socialist community, a cult compound as I see it, built on that very principle in upstate New York, roughly 30 miles east of Syracuse. As he sought hyper promiscuous interlocked contact, aka lots of vaginal sex between men and women in the form of a polyamory scheme he called complex marriage could generate enough spiritual energy to literally propel the human race into an electrically powered, divinely connected, eternal life. Confusing? Allow me to explain. Picture Dr. Frankenstein harnessing electricity to make his monster come to life. And now replace Dr. Frankenstein with John Humphrey Noyce. And then substitute a lot of penises, hundreds or thousands or maybe even millions, for the corpse of Frankenstein's monster. And then replace the lightning with a lot of vaginas. And finally, instead of bringing one corpse back to life from one lightning strike, you could bring a whole community into immortality through so many lightning strikes. And by lightning strikes, I mean penis-vagina intercourse. Still confused? Well, if it doesn't make any sense, don't blame me for being confusing. Blame John Humphrey Noyce. Noyce did pretty well for himself uh, overall, despite being a total maniac. He founded the Oneida Community, a group of perfectionists or Bible communists or creepy weirdos. In 1848, these people built a utopian religious community that developed out of the Society of Inquiry, another group established by John Humphrey Noyes and some of his disciples in Putney, Vermont, seven years earlier in 1841. In Oneida, Noyes made his followers participate in complex marriage, a fancy term for free love in which all the men in the community were married to all the women and vice versa. Men were encouraged to have sex with women, all the women, but they were not to ejaculate. That wasn't good for one's energy. And they needed all that energy, obviously, to become immortal. But sometimes it was also necessary to expend a little bit of energy to create more energy down the road by having special power kids who were super energy conductors because their parents were extra godly. You get it, don't you? John Humphrey Noyes got it. In some cases, for uh, breeding, it was obviously necessary to ejaculate. If you wanted to do that, you had to get permission from Noyes to participate in his totally normal, selective breeding, uh, religion-based eugenics program. And since no one wore condoms, because that would interfere with all the energy creation, when you weren't trying to make a baby, it was really important to get good at having lots of raw sex, but not ejaculating. And how do you learn how to do that? Practice, silly. Noise instructed young men, just, you know, got through puberty young men, to have lots of practice sex with older postmenopausal women, so there would be zero chance of pregnancy. Meanwhile, to ensure that the most fertile females weren't accidentally impregnated by sloppy, careless, energy amateurs, Noyes decided that he and his friends, a bunch of not horny at all dudes in their 30s or older, they were the only guys in the community with enough self-control to have sex with young, attractive virgins. Totally makes sense. All good and godly. Can't read anything shady and self-serving and pervy into all that. Not at all. Over 300 people lived together and participated in all of this at the height of the community's madness. And this community would last for over 30 years until 1879 when Noyes, worried about getting thrown in prison for statutory rape charges, for some weird reason, fled the country. And then from Canada, he told his followers to abandon the practice of community marriage. Now that the law was after him, God changed his mind about everything. Huh, weird. And his followers did abandon their group love experiment. Then in 1880, the year after Noyes fled, his former followers transitioned from an energy sex reactor compound to a really nice silverware company. A really, really successful silverware company. I bet many of your grandparents covet their fine Oneida flatware. That silverware is still famous today. This is such a weird story. And it's all true. And all will be told today on another cult, cult, cult edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Get the fuck in here. We have so much weird shit to talk about today. I'm Dan Cummins, a master sucker, walking nickname generator, cutlery expert, especially spoons. You get it. And you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. 
couple brief announcements and then show. New Time Suck merch in the Bad Magic store this week. This one's for the Meat Sacks who enjoy a serial killer suck from time to time. Yet another logo variant to add to your growing Bad Magic closet. New true crime inspired scratch logo tee and sweatshirt available. Is it wet paint? Is it blood? Find out. Badmagicmerch.com. Uh, Symphony of Insanity Tour uh, still kicking off in San Diego at the La Jolla Comedy Store this January 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Some shows sold out uh, already, so grab those quick if you if you do want to come. I hope you want to come. And then Hollywood at the Comedy Store uh, on the 23rd. Many more dates up at dancummins.tv. Uh, first Bad Magic Productions charity of 2022. Still love thy neighbor. Still that 5013C nonprofit, primarily serving Denver and the surrounding area. Uh, working with generous local businesses, these living saints hand out free food to the homeless and give clothing, blankets, uh, et cetera, distribute them to the homeless. Literally keep people alive by supplying both food and clothing to people homeless in a cold city. And because of our space lizards, able to give them $15,500 this month. To find out more and or donate yourself, go to ltnsocks.com. And now... Back to the world of cult, cult, cult. This is a particularly fun one. Uh, today, we are digging into, as you know, the Oneida community, which uh, kind of kicked off in 1841 uh, in Putney, Vermont. Uh, a soft grand opening there, if you will, when John Humphrey Noyes was still ironing out how to twist scripture into fulfilling his sexual desires before moving to just outside the fledgling village of Oneida. Uh, New York in 1848, same year the village was incorporated. And they lasted until 1879 in that form. And then the community, you know, started to morph into a uh, sales company that became a major flatware corporation. I love that twist so much. Uh, That is so unique. Oneida, of course, this flatware is hard and lasts longer than any of our competitors' flatware. Our spoons, knives, and forks were born from fucking. Uh, the United community, uh, weird as they were, were not a typical or traditional cult. Some historians and theologians, others, hesitate to define them as a cult at all. Uh, there wasn't any violence. Noise wasn't beating members to intimidate them into not leaving. Members were not forbidden from keeping in contact with their pre-cult friends and families. Uh, Noise did not present himself as a, as a god or as a mm, prophet. Not exactly close, kind of. Uh, you did have to engage in basically hero worship of John Humphrey Noyes, and you had to fuck him, you know, if he wanted to fuck you, if he didn't want to be ostracized and get dressed down in some kind of messed up mockery of group therapy. Uh, You also were supposed to fuck a lot of other cult members, which is uh, not how cults usually tend to operate. Uh, You had to sign off on other weird sex stuff. You had to agree to let the community raise your children if you had any and more. Uh, Many would prefer to, uh, you know, refer to this group as as a strange community, a social experiment instead of as a, quote, cult. Uh, But cult still feels right to me. One dictionary definition of the word is a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or senator. Uh, That definition certainly fits. They were a relatively small group of people and they for sure had religious beliefs regarded by many others as strange as fuck. Uh, Noise had a lot of strange ideas, especially about sex. His ideas would weird a lot of people out uh, today and they really weirded people out back in the mid-19th century. That time in America, most women were were thought of as delicate daughters, uh, you know, mothers who had to be protected, kept aside in their own special domestic sphere, while the men went out, earned money, and participated in politics in their sphere. Noise would reject uh, pretty much all that. America, especially the East Coast, when this went down, where this went down, excuse me, was still heavily influenced by British culture. Uh, you know, this is the Victorian era, a time defined largely by acting prim and proper. Victorian era sexuality defined by a great deal of austerity. Having sexual desire was identified almost solely with men uh, and with women of lower classes. It was a dirty thing, repugnant, right? Urges that the filthy poor and the uneducated gave into thanks to their lower breeding, not giving them the ability to steel themselves against their base animalistic urges. It was not proper. Lucifina just rolled her eyes. She yawned a bit. Uh, Many doctors of the day actually believed that women literally had no sexual drive. Zero. I mean, how, how could they? They were pure virginal mothers or soon-to-be mothers, mothers in waiting, or retired mothers, right? Their, their vagina is nothing more than sperm tunnels to protect important product on its way to those fallopian tubes. Their clitorises were, uh, well, <laughs> no one studied those, and they just, you know, we're, we're going to pretend they don't exist. Please, please don't bring it up again. They, they bother us. Uh, getting horny, that was a man's business. A proper woman was a virgin until marriage, and then even in marriage, she didn't really enjoy sex. Come on, Gross! 
She would lay there passively as God intended, thinking about Jesus, while her husband thrusted and grunted away until he'd planted a seed, and then, you know, he could roll over and beg God to forgive him for any sinful thoughts he may have had while in the throes of devilish passion. The woman did not indulge in sex for enjoyment. The act was for childbearing only, not for pleasure. Now, did everyone follow these rules of proper society? No, I mean, fuck no. There was also tons of sex work going on in Victorian society. It was all just a silly game. You know, a lot of people played, uh, a lot of people pretended to play. But publicly in polite society, sex really was just not talked about, especially sex outside of marriage. Uh, The thought of a bunch of people living in a big mansion, all fucking each other all the time, would uh, probably literally cause some people, uh, you know, hearing about that to faint from shock. Maybe even have an aneurysm, going to cardiac arrest. Been so shocking. Noise defied the sexual conventions of his day in a major way. Dude undoubtedly got a lot of glares, heard a lot of mumbling about what a perverse degenerate he was by locals who knew what he was up to and were not one of his followers when he would leave the compound. Noise didn't feel that monogamy was essential for a stable society. He felt it went against God's will, went against God's plan for it. And that was a massive rejection. Monogamy was seen, is still seen as one of the core tenets of American life and society. And homeboy was just like, uh, nah, fuck that. I'm honestly surprised a lynch mob never just came and burned down his compound and hanged this guy. Like truly surprised. Uh, in addition to some strange sexual practices, Noise's followers also endured uh, group criticism sessions, which were attended by the entire community at first. And then later, as the community grew, uh, were conducted before committees presided over by Noise. Uh, they remind me of the uh, Alon School suck. Remember that? Uh, when we sucked Joe Ricci and the assholes who worked for him screaming at kids already dealing with parents who didn't want them or mental issues and uh, whatnot during Alon general meetings, telling them how much they sucked. Uh, Noise was an early pioneer of this now heavily rejected therapeutic practice. Now, did this criticism uh, maybe have some therapeutic value as a means of releasing feelings of guilt and aggression for followers? Yeah, maybe. Was it also a cult-like shaming technique that enforced social control and a highly successful device for promoting cult-like community cohesion and group think? Oh, absolutely. Noise might have uh, went on to become some Joseph Smith type, founder of the Church of Latter. Uh, you know, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in a parallel universe where he refused to flee the country and instead headed out west to find his own land to settle on. Maybe. Or maybe his ideas were just too extreme. People back in the early 19th century were shocked by early Mormon polygamous practices. They were more shocked by noises, uh, you know, let's let uh, fucking our group fuck our way into heaven ideas. Uh, interestingly, uh, Smith and Noise shared a lot in common. They were from the same era and area. Noise was starting to come up with his religious theories in the late 1830s, right after Joseph Smith first wrote the Book of Mormon. Both men born in Vermont, just six years apart. Joseph in 1805, John in 1811. Both came up with their new religious views in New York, just 90 miles and about a decade apart. Joseph got going in the 1830s and, you know, Palmyra. John really got going in the 1840s in Oneida. Both were part of a wave of religious radicalism in Western upstate New York in the early and mid 19th century. Both born or, you know, came up with their ideas, got their ideas going in an area uh, termed the Burned Over District. We talked about this area a few times before. In addition to Mormonism and the Oneida community, the Fox sisters began conducting seances in this area in Hydesville, New York in 1848. Uh, Those seances would lead to the American spiritualism movement. Hello, Ouija boards. Uh, The Amana colonies of Iowa, another utopian social experiment, began in New York as the Ebenezer colonies near Buffalo Hello, refrigerators. Seriously, uh, the Amana Corporation came out of these colonies. Uh, now they're a $5 billion appliance corporation specializing in refrigerators. Refrigerators and silverware. Who fucking knew <laughs> that shit would come out of all this craziness? Uh, also, the Millerites originated in Lowhampton, New York. They morphed, morphed into the Adventists, uh, which the Seventh-day Adventists uh, sprang out of in a fair amount of cults like Waco's Branch Davidians, led by David Koresh, uh, the Ant Hill Kids, led by Rock Terrio, they sprang out of the Seventh-day Adventists. Interesting place and time in history, right? Part of the Second Great Awakening. Uh, The Second Great Awakening was a Protestant religious revival during the early 19th century in the U.S., and it really took hold in the area around the New Erie Canal. Charles Finney, 19th century American Presbyterian minister, leader in the Second Great Awakening, wrote in his autobiography of this area, years after the religious revival had passed, I found that region of country what in the Western phrase would be called a burnt district. There had been a few years previously a wild excitement passing through the region. It was reported as having been a very extravagant excitement and resulted in a reaction so extensive and profound as to leave the impression on many minds that religion was a mere delusion. What I just took from that passage was uh, 
Some of those motherfuckers took that shit way too far. And they gave all religion a bad name. While many of the burnt uh, out districts, new religions became very successful despite taking things too far in many people's minds. Uh, Mormonism has long been one of the world's fastest growing religions now. Most other groups flamed out, like the Oneida community. And that's probably a good thing. Not sure our society would be better off if a sizable percentage of us were practicing free love and having our kids raised by the community. Uh, I think. I'm not a prude. I think most of you know that by now. And I actually have no moral qualms uh, with polygamy. If it works for you, you know, good for you. I just don't feel like from what I've, uh, I've observed that it does work better than monogamy for most people. We're such emotional creatures. And while monogamy uh, certainly has its shortcomings, uh, you know, they seem to be less. Uh, it seems to be emotionally uh, less complicated than being part of a, a sex team. And life is already so complicated. Uh, individuals who question the validity of monogamy often cite this type of partnership as outdated, overly restrictive, uh, even biologically unnatural, high divorce rates, reports of infidelity, sexual boredom, long been cited as reasons to oppose or abandon monogamy. Fair, fair criticisms. Uh, individuals who favor monogamy will cite bonding, emotional intimacy, decreased worries of uh, STDs, STIs, uh, not getting random people pregnant as reasons to champion monogamy. I don't know. Not enough data out there to really compare the two and determine which lifestyle overall is the best. Uh, I imagine monogamy is better for some. Polygamy is better for others. I think, you know, monogamy is probably better for most. Uh, and then there's that thing of like, what about the children? I mean, personally, I am glad I was raised in a monogamous household, divorce and all as opposed to the polyamorous shit show that was the Oneida community. I think, uh, I don't know, be extra confusing having a, uh, a lot of different parents, no real parents. Uh, I'm digressing now. After that long introduction into our topic and providing some historical context for this topic, let me just lay out how the rest of the info in this suck is going to be presented today. It's a pretty straightforward structure. Uh, we'll cover most of the Oneida community, its formation, practices, and eventual disintegration uh, and then transformation into uh, you know flatware company in the timeline. Uh, before that, let's examine a few of the philosophical ideas behind it. Some historians have called the Oneida community the most successful of the utopian socialist community experience. Uh, community, what did I say experience? Uh, exper experiments. <laughs> I almost said it again in the United States. So what the hell is utopian socialism? Well, socialism probably makes you think of Marx, Engels, the communist manifesto. Uh, but Marx and Engels were not utopian socialists. Uh, they thought that, uh, you know, they were realists preparing for an inevitable class war while the utopian socialist ethos will be best described by the phrase, uh, why can't we all just, you know, get along? Uh, why, why can't we all just get along and do what I want to do? Uh, utopian socialism is an even less realistic version of extreme socialism than, uh, later socialists and communists, you know, uh, writers like Karl Marx would dismiss as being naive and unrealistic. The term applies to a school of socialist thought that was only ever really popular in the early 19th century. And not kidding here, getting cute, making fun of communism. Uh, most later 19th and 20th century socialists uh, have laughed at this shit. One key difference between utopian socialists and other socialists, such as, uh, you know, anarchists, Marxists, is that utopian socialists generally do not believe any form of class struggle or social revolution is necessary for socialism to emerge. Utopian socialists believe that people of all classes can voluntarily adopt their plan for society if it's presented convincingly because it's, you know, so, so cool. Basically, utopian socialists like noise, believed that if they built a little slice of paradise based on whatever they thought paradise looked like, you know, such as everyone fucking each other to generate a bunch of, uh, this is how we get to heaven, immortality energy, more and more people would want to say goodbye to their current notions of morality and lifestyles and just join on in. And it would just keep spreading organically, right? Just like that until the whole world was rebuilt in their image of utopia. Everyone fucking everyone, everyone immortal, everyone making silverware or something like that. Uh, the word utopia coined by English author Thomas Moore, an English lawyer, judge, and social philosopher, author, and statesman. Uh, Moore was a Renaissance humanist, deemed a saint by the Catholic Church, and he wrote Utopia in 1515, a book about a fictional island society and its religious, social, and political customs. He wrote of a world of immense individual freedom and equality governed by reason at a time when such a vision was almost inconceivable. Here's a little sample passage. In Utopia, where every man has a right to everything, they all know that if care is taken to keep the public stores full, no private man can want anything, for among them there is no unequal distribution, so that no man is poor, none in necessity, and though no man has anything, yet they are all rich. For what can make a man so rich as to lead a serene and cheerful life, free from anxieties? 
Uh, incredibly, Thomas More was in his mid thirties when he wrote that and not like 11 or 12 years old. It's a really sweet thought, but not practical at fucking all <laughs> when you logically play it out. Every man has a right to everything. No private man could want for anything. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. What happens when say three different men, uh, each want the exact same woman. And what if she doesn't want any of them? Or what happens when three different guys all want to live on the exact same property in this utopia, right? The one where there's a a pristine babbling brook rolling out into the sea and there's a perfect little bench to build a home on and that spot has easily the best views of the entire island. What if the three guys don't like each other, don't want to live together on this property, right? Only uh, max, best case, only one of them gets what they want in that scenario. Or even simpler, what if all three of the guys want a piece of Mary's awesome lemon cake, but there's only one slice left and they don't want to share it and she doesn't have enough fucking lemons, you know, to make any more right now. I could go on and on, but you get it. There is no world where everyone just gets whatever they want. <laughs> Anybody who actually believes that, I just think like, are you fucking grown up? Like what, what is happening? Do you just, have you just never had to worry about money? You just, you know, born with a fucking trust, trust fund and just like great health or something. What do you, what are you talking about? It's a child's fantasy. Uh, and this form is more eroded. It's fucking nonsense. A utopia like that, as wonderful as it sounds, will never, ever exist. In my opinion, I feel it very strongly. Uh, you know, I also believe that, uh, you know, every rational historian, economist, and just basically reasonable person (laughs) thinks this, it's just not compatible with human nature. Much of your life, fair or not, will forever be tied to a never ending battle for resources, land, food, water rights on and on. And it always will be. So, uh, you know, I think better and much more practical, I think to make your peace with that, learn how to play the game. You know, uh, you became a part of at birth, like it or not as best you can, instead of wasting time thinking you can get the world to agree to stop playing Monopoly and start playing, I don't know, little kid's tea party or some shit. Harsh, I know, but every fiber of my being believes this to be true. Uh, But also, I do truly love that idealists are writing all this stuff because, you know, I think that we can improve society further than it is right now and more realistic versions originally inspired by overly idealistic notions can and have for sure made the world a better place, you know, time and time again. Uh, Thomas More. Not the only big picture dreamer toying with the ideas of utopia in the 16th century. With the Reformation in Germany and numerous independent republics enjoying new freedoms in Northern Italy, modern egalitarian ideas were spreading in a number of utopian ideas being published in the 1500s. Italian writer and sa- satirist, satirist, satirical, satirist, there we go. Antonio uh, Doni's uh, humanist, The World was published in 1552. Venetian philosopher, uh, Francesco, uh, Patrizzi's The Happy City was published in 1553 and Italian theologian and philosopher uh, Tommaso Campanella. It is so fun. I haven't done that in a while. It's so fun to say Italian names with a little bit of flair. Uh, Tommaso Campanella. Uh, his, uh, the City of the Sun was published at the dawn of the 17th century in 1602. And more authors continue to imagine what an ideal society would look like in the 17th century. English statement and philosopher Francis Bacon wrote about utopia uh, in his novel, New Atlantis in 1602. Uh, 1627 tells of a lost civilization that lives in perfect harmony and peace their society is dedicated to the accumulation of knowledge and the study of science and nature their division of labor labor being akin to that of a modern research institute a social embodiment of the ideal of reason and then late 18th and early 19th century french philosopher charles uh fourier uh, one of the founders of utopian socialism would write about utopian socialism as it was practiced by the oneida community Charles Fourier lived from 1772 to 1837, and Charles's vision of utopia was based on the absolute suppression of individualism in favor of an all-pervasive collectivism. And collectivism, if you don't know, I sure as hell didn't know when I uh, first read about this, is the practice or principle of giving a group priority over each individual in it. And it seems to me then that utopian, so, uh, utopian socialism is a bit of an oxymoron. Like, how can a utopia be anything other than a place where, as Moore wrote, no private man can want for anything, right? It reeks of individualism to me. Once you suppress what you want and place what is better for the group ahead of your own desires, now you are living in a socialist state. And in that state where you always think of the group ahead of yourself, can you ever really find ultimate fulfillment and happiness? Maybe some can, but this individualist leaning libertarian meat sack cannot. Uh, Doesn't add up for me. Uh, Fourier came up with his ideas in response to the Industrial Revolution, which was spurred on by the economic prosperity created by laissez-faire capitalism, which meant there were little or no government intervention. There was little or no government intervention in the economy. The focus on limited government allowed European industrialists to use their wealth in order to develop factories, mines, and mills without much regulation or interference from government policies. And then they completely oppressed the shit out of the working class. 
And that I'm not favor in favor of either. Uh, for all the times I've shit on elements of extreme socialism and, of course, communism, I'm also adamantly opposed to completely unregulated capitalism for this very reason. I don't like communism because I don't want the state making too many decisions regarding how I get to live. And I don't like unregulated capitalism because I don't want, you know, greedy, ruthless, modern day robber barons dictating how I get to live. Given the people in power too much power, whether they be uh, government officials or corporate titans, that never seems to work out too well for everyone else. Power really does seem to corrupt. We need laws, you know, just not too many laws. Uh, at the end of the day, governing a large population is such a complicated business, isn't it? And because it is, I think we'll uh, argue about it until the end of humanity. Uh, during Charles Fourier's time, the capitalism he witnessed allowed the industrialists to create large amounts of wealth for themselves, often resulted in horrible working conditions for the working class people who worked in their you know, places. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution, workers often struggled due to low pay, long work hours, difficult and dangerous work, little to no benefits, constant fear of being fired and replaced. And these conditions, while very beneficial to the wealthy, uh, very beneficial to the Purdue Pharmas of the 19th century, were obviously disastrous for the majority of society who made up the working class. As a result, early socialists sought to correct these conditions in the hopes of creating a more equitable society for all people. And that pursuit could not be more noble. And I do understand why they sought to change things. And based on these new ideas, some socialist utopian communities began to pop up where people tried to put these ideas into practice. Inspired by Charles Fourier, another utopian socialist, Robert Owen, tried to create a utopian city by buying basically an entire existing fucking town in Indiana called Harmony and renaming it New Harmony in 1825. Dude bought 180 buildings and thousands of acres of land. Owen's social experiment didn't last long, only two years, before it was abandoned by the roughly 1,000 people who tried it out because they weren't able to make it uh, economically viable. But it was very influential to other utopian socialists, and the town itself is actually still there. A stupid, cute little town of around 800 people now. Uh, the environs, the wages, conditions, education provided for the children during the short duration of New Harmony as a utopian socialist experiment uh, more than a century ahead of its time. We owe our modern eight-hour workday largely to Owen. He instituted it, uh, instituted it at the large cotton mill he owned in Scotland when that was unheard of. By 1817, he had formulated the goal of an eight-hour working day with the slogan, eight hours labor, eight hours recreation, eight hours rest. God, that sounds nice. Uh, Owen envisioned a, a world of small communities, 500 to 3,000 people in size that would mainly be agricultural, possess the best machinery, offer varied employment, and as far as possible, you know, each uh, you know, colony be self-contained. And while he did not bring his vision to light, uh, you know, he did inspire a lot of others to do the same in the 19th century in America. At least 130 social experiments were launched, and at least 16 of them were influenced heavily by Owen. And Owen was far from the only idealist to try and create a utopian town in 19th century America. Between 1841 and 1859, at least 28 colonies were established by the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. by followers of Charles Fourier. Most only lasted a few years. The Oneida community, the most successful of all these communities. And for sure, the fucking weirdest. Uh, another uh, important term in regards to understanding the Oneida community we should go over before jumping into today's timeline that will start with the birth of founder John Humphrey Noyes and extend beyond his death is Bible communism. Bible communism was essentially a utopian socialism combined with biblical interpretation. Noise did a mashup of French socialist ideals with Christianity. Real interesting interpretation of Christianity. Uh, Noise published a book titled Bible Communism in 1848, same year he founded the Oneida community. And uh, thank you to Syracuse University for uh, converting that long out of print book into digital form so I could take a peek uh, and making it free for the public. Uh, kudos to you. Uh, here's how Noise linked Christianity and communism. He wrote, we hold that all the systems of property getting in vogue in the world are forms of what is vulgarly, vulgarly called the grab game, i.e. the game in which the prizes are not distributed by any rules of wisdom and justice, but are seized by the strongest and craftiest, and that the laws of the world simply give rules more or less civilized for the conduct of this game. Okay. I mean, dude wasn't an idiot. It wasn't an idiot. I mean, that is the game. I'll give him that. Uh, he continues. That the whole system thus defined is based on the false assumption that the land and goods of the world previously to the, their possession by man have no owner and rightfully become the property of anyone who first gets possession, which assumption denies the original title of the creator, excludes him from his right of distribution and makes the grab game in one form or the other inevitable. Uh, 
that God the creator has the first and firmest title to all property whatsoever, that he therefore has the right of distribution, that no way of escape from the miseries of the grab game will ever be found till his title and right of distribution are practically acknowledged, that in the approaching reign of inspiration, he will assert his ownership, be acknowledged and installed as distributor, and thus the reign of covetedness, competition, and violence will come to an end. I interpret him, or this, as him saying, None of us really own anything because we're mortal and when we die, we relinquish our hold on our property and then it returns to God who owned it the whole time anyway, right? That point is uh, actually in alignment with a lot of American Indian forms of spirituality. Uh, And then as I interpret it, you know, he's saying that when God comes back, the whole concept of the second coming and God's kingdom being built here on earth, aka heaven on earth, we've gone over this concept time and time again while covering numerous doomsday cults. Uh, When God returns, every meat sack will no longer own anything. So why are we pretending to own anything now? Why don't we already live in accordance with God's plan? You know, and obviously the, the fucking major problem with this is who gets to speak for God? You know, who gets to, you know, pretend to know God's plan? Uh, noise continues that God never so makes over property to man as to divest himself of his own title. And of course, that man can never in reality have absolute and exclusive ownership of lands, goods, or even of himself or his productions, but only sub- subordinate joint ownership with God that in the kingdom of God, every loyal citizen is subordinate joint owner with God of all things. And then he bases that on Revelation chapter 21, verse seven. I think all of that was just a continuance of the interpretation I already gave. Uh, he adds a little more that the right of individual possession of the specific goods of the universe under this general joint ownership is determined by the arbit- uh, arbitrament of God uh, through inspiration, direct or indirect, that there is no other right of property beyond these two, the right of general joint ownership by unity with God and the right of possession as determined by inspiration that the right of possession in the case of articles directly consumed in the use is necessarily equivalent to exclusive ownership, but in all other cases is only the right of beneficial use subject to the principle of rotation and to the distributive rights of God. My interpretation, God lets us use, you know, aka fucking borrow his shit, but we don't get to keep it. Fine. Which is basically what he, he just kind of keeps repeating himself a little bit. Uh, replace God with nature. And I think this assertion works for, uh, you know, uh, almost all meat sacks. You know, if you replace that nature or God with nature for some, and then he writes, it will be seen from the statement of principles that the Oneida Association cannot properly be said to stand on any ordinary platform of communism. Their doctrine is that of community, not merely or chiefly with each other, but with God. And for the security of individual rights, they look not to constitutions or compacts with each other, but to the wisdom and goodness of the spirit of truth, which is above all. But of course, as interpreted by noise, uh, the idea of their system stated in its simplest form is that all believers constitute the family of God, that all valuables, whether persons or things, are family property, and that all the labors of the family are directed, judged, and rewarded in the distribution of enjoyments by the Father. So here he's saying, you know, like communism, you know, can be fucked up because it's men running it. But in this situation, it wouldn't be men. I mean, yeah, I'm the one fucking saying everything and laying down the rules, but really, I speak for God. So it's, you know, it's God running things. And then he adds that verse where the, whether persons or things, that concept, uh, I think is one of the tenets he based a uh, group fucking on. And he just kind of glosses over it here. And then he clearly links the ideals of communism with the ideals of his interpretation, again, of Christian God. Now he talks about how well his brand of Bible communism has already been working back at his original utopian socialism uh, place in Putney, Vermont, that he got fucking kicked out of, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, uh, underage, having sex with underage uh, women. He kind of just glosses over that. Uh, perhaps the best Iconium on these principles may be deduced from the fact that the association under the influence of them has lived in entire harmony in relation to property interests for six years and has met with no difficulty in respect to the distribution of possessions and privileges. No accounts are kept between the members of the association or between the several members members, and there is no more occasion for them than there is between man and wife or than there was between the several members of the family which gathered around the apostles on the day of the Pentecost. The association believes that in the kingdom of heaven, every man will be rewarded according to his works with far greater exactness than is done in the kingdoms of this world, but it does not believe that money is the currency in which rewards are to be distributed and accounts balance. The idea is that love is the appropriate reward of labor, i.e. fucking, uh, that in a just spiritual medium, every individual by the fixed laws of attraction, there's more references to fucking, will draw around him an amount of love exactly proportioned to his intrinsic value and efficiency. Better you are, more pussy you get. And thus all accounts will be punctually and justly balanced without the complicated and cumbersome machinery of bookkeeping. He dances around, you know, with his, uh, with his wordplay, you know, fuck everybody, fuck each other here again. You know, when he writes every, every individual, you know, by the laws of attraction rule, as I said there, uh, based on what else I know about his beliefs and what he did, this is, uh, you know, him just alluding to the, you know, again, the more, uh, a dude is in a, a alignment with God's, you know, will, i.e. my will, 
you know, the, the more young immortality energy sex he gets. And, you know, same for women. All right, let me just share just a tiny bit more of his Bible communism writings. As to the legal titles of land and other property, no special measures have been taken to secure the association from individuals. Those who owned or purchased lands in their own name at the beginning have retained their deeds. And no formal transfer of any property brought in by the members has been made to the association. The stock of the company has been consolidated by love and not by law. The terms of admission, so far as property is concerned, are stated in the register of the association as follows. On the admission of any member, all property belonging to him or her becomes the property of the association. A record of the estimated amount will be kept. And in case the subsequent withdrawal of the member of the association, according to its practice uh, heretofore, will refund the property or an equivalent amount. The practice, however, stands on the ground, not of obligation, but of expediency and liberality. And the time and manner of refunding must be trusted to the discretion of the association. While a person remains a member, his substance and education in the association are held to be just equivalents for his labor. And no accounts are kept from, uh, no accounts are kept between him and the association and no claim of wages accrues to him in case of subsequent withdrawal. That was all a real nice way of saying, when you come live with us, you do sign ownership of all your worldly property over to us. And then if you want to leave, we'll give back an equivalent amount of assets when and how we see fit at our, i.e. my discretion. Cult, cult, cult. I guarantee you that once you signed over your shit to John Humphrey Noyes, you never got it all back. Get the fuck out of here. Now, just one more sentence from this book before we uh, hop on into the timeline. We apply these principles not only to property and social rights, but to our ownership of ourselves. That's definitely some cult shit. We don't just collectively own your shit when you join up with us. We also own you as well. (laughs) We get to fuck you. Now get in here and help make me immortal. And with all the philosophical basis now for the ideals of the community and or cult I'm about to describe uh, laid on out, let's dig into today's timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time-suck timeline. September 3rd, 1811. The future founder of the United Community, John Humphrey Noyes, born in Brattleboro, Vermont. Such a pretty town. Uh, there's, there are so many picturesque little towns all around the world. Uh, this one in the heart of the Connecticut River Valley, home of the Vermont Jazz Center. Everyone knows. When you think about jazz, you think about Brattleboro, Vermont. Uh, Roughly 12,000 people there today, right across the river from New Hampshire, just about 10 miles north of the Massachusetts state line. Uh, Back in 1811, there was about 1,900 people there. Small for today, but decent-sized town for the U.S. over 200 years ago. John was the son of a well-to-do New England businessman and politician also named John. His father had grown up in New Hampshire, attended the prestigious high school, the Phillips Exeter Academy, opened in 1781. So many famous alumni. In the school, holy shit, uh, Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert uh, Robert studied there, uh, as did the son of President Ulysses S. Grant, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, uh, presidential candidate Andrew Yang, authors Gore Vidal, Dan Brown, John Irving, a bunch of Nobel Prize winners, a bunch of founders of big companies, more politicians, musicians, actors, even serial killer, previous suck subject H.H. H. Holmes studied there. After graduating, uh, John Humphrey's father worked variously as a minister, teacher, businessman, Congressman representing Vermont for a term as the member of the U.S. House of Representatives. John's dad, like his son, will later study at Dartmouth. That Ivy League school has been around since 1769, one of nine colonial colleges chartered before the American Revolution. Initially, when both Johns went there, it was a very religious school, primarily training Congressionalist ministers. And John's parents did hope their son would grow up to be a minister, especially mob. And he would do that. He just, you know, wouldn't be the kind of minister they would uh, originally hope for. <laughs> Not even fucking close. John's mom, Polly Noyes, that's a weird ass name. I mean, that wasn't her birth name, but you know, when she took a married name, Polly Noyes. Polly Noyes. Sounds like a fucking type of plastic or something. Uh, was the aunt to uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, 19th president of the United States, our uh, cult uh, leader's first cousin. The matriarch of the Noyes family, well-respected in the community, uh, you know, big into the local church, deeply religious woman who felt it was her duty to make sure her kids were raised to be, you know, strong Christians. John grew up in a very well-to-do, very proper Protestant New England family. Super WASPy. WASP here standing for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Term that has come to refer to early Americans descended from Northern European, usually Protestant stock, forming a cultural group often considered the most dominant, privileged, and influential in the history of American society. John was born the fourth of nine children. Young John was said to be a, a thoughtful boy. As a child, he was uh, fond of going to bed early because he wanted to think. 
It's a quote. He wanted to think. Hopefully he wasn't thinking of electric group sex quite yet. Also a natural leader. As his mom recalled in later years, I can see him now marching up off the hill at the head of a company of his playmates. Sent away to school in Amherst, Massachusetts when he was nine in 1820. Little John sent letters home that revealed a boy seized by homesickness, but also anxious not to upset his mother. He was also certainly very intelligent writing. And again, this is uh, at nine years old. Mama, I must say that when I'm not reading or writing or studying, I am homesick. Yes, I am homesick, but away with all this. I fear I've distressed you already. Tell Papa that I'm studying Cicero and that I have got, uh, and that I've got to the fourth book of Virgil. Fuck, what? Cicero and Virgil? Nine, he's writing that? Oh my God. I comparatively am fucking a complete idiot. At that age, I would have probably written something like, Mom, I like it. Spaghetti's good. Do you stop my Legos? Please, do not throw away my Legos. I love them. Also, tell Dad to not throw away my Legos. I love you. Bye. P.S. Also, do not throw away my He-Man guys. Or bike. Or anything. Uh, that would have actually been a fucking... I would have been impressed with that letter if I would have been able to write that at age nine. Uh, in 1821, when he was 10, John and his family relocated to the village of Putney, Vermont. Just 10 miles from Brattleboro. Where John would now attend the Brattleboro Academy. Where he compete his, uh, or complete his preparation for college. If that uh, school still exists, it doesn't seem to be under that name anymore. Uh, the scrawny, freckled redhead was a horny kid at the academy. No surprise there. One friend from his school days would uh, later say that he was uh, filled with a little too much libido corporis. Latin for lust for the body. Real fancy way of saying he was a randy little horn dog. 1829, 18-year-old Noyes began attending his father's alma mater, Dartmouth. And in his diary, he wrote mostly about young women. Pretty normal for an 18-year-old, you know, but for the times, he again seemed to be hornier than the average horn dog. In 1830, old sex noise. Old Johnny sex noise. Done with Dartmouth. The studies there only lasted a year. Uh, it wasn't the four years or more institution it is today for most students. He got himself an internship at his uh, brother-in-law, Larkin Mead's practice in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. He seemed bound for a legal career and a normal life. He didn't want to be a minister, which disappointed mother, but uh, dad was okay with it because he wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, he started to date a woman he referred to in his diary as Carolyn M. Maybe Caroline. Caroline M. There we go. Yeah, definitely Caroline. Uh, even wrote her a poem. Let me set some uh, uh, period piece music to make it uh, a little bit more palatable. Hmm. Uh-huh. Mark, Caroline, Jan Weston Sky, Deep Tension Crimson Light. The sun's red glories haste to die, and swift comes on the night. Then hasten, ere the twilight ends, far down the vale will roam. No pause till our night descends, then love should light us home. Motherfucker, yes! Uh, that's not exact. I added the motherfucker at the end, you know that. Uh, maybe that was Deadly Innocent style, and not early 19th century style, but I promise that made it better. That made it more fun. I wonder if she absolutely loved that poem, or read it to her friends for a laugh. I feel like it could have gone either way. Feels like a real toy, uh, coin toss. Real real toin toss. <laughs> uh, John's legal internship came to an end in 1831. He returned home to Putney and he and Caroline's love affair was over. She was not willing to move to Putney with him, it seems. Uh, doesn't sound like they ever had much of a love affair. According to his diary, they never did more than uh, talk and attend some dances together. I'm guessing the entirety of their sexual life was him alone in his bed at night, quietly beating off to thoughts of what her body you know, might look like under whatever giant, down-to-the-floor, form-hiding Victorian dress she wore to the dance early that evening. Uh, he never created any penis-vagina immortality energy with her. No electric sex. Not even regular sex. In the fall of 1831, at his mother's prompting, Noyes attended a religious revival in Putney. This would change his life. Against all expectations, he experienced a powerful conversion. I mean, it wasn't that he wasn't a Christian earlier. He did attend church and he said all the right things. You know, he prayed and whatnot. But now he, he really, he felt it. The spirit took him. Did it ever. Uh, 1831, big year for religious revivals in New England. Revivals that have been sweeping across the Northeast for over a decade. Perhaps the biggest year, 1831. That second great awakening I spoke of earlier. It's in full effect. And the evangelist Charles Finney, uh, who I quoted earlier, talking about how crazy the, the second awakening, uh, you know, great awakening got, uh, was uh, the one whose sermon captivated John. I guess he talked about that burnt over district. But Finney was an incredibly popular preacher at that time. He was, a, he was a real fire and brimstone guy with a special talent for making people really believe that God's wrath was, was real, as was his love for you if you repented and committed your soul to Christ. He made you genuinely worry about your salvation. And he always gave those listening hope, though, that through the power of their belief in the Lord, 
to accepting and sharing God's grace and love. They can hasten the return of Christ, actively help God create his kingdom here on earth, you know, be a part of everything, be forgiven, all that stuff. And this message would really stick with John Humphrey's sex noise. He'd want to share so much love to create this magical kingdom. By the time Finney's revival is over, John had decided to become a minister. He then quickly enrolled uh, first at the Andover Theological Seminary, 110 miles east of Putney in uh, Massachusetts, then soon transferred to Yale in New Haven, West Connecticut, or West Connecticut, what the fuck am I talking about? New, <laughs> hey, it's a new state. Don't even, don't look it up. Don't Google it. For a short t- time, there was West Connecticut. You've heard of it. Uh, no, it was New Haven, Connecticut, 150 miles south of Andover to study theology there. And mama was stoked. Uh, at Yale, primarily a religious institution at this time as well, he would form most of the beliefs that would later be the foundation of his socialist utopia, including one that I did not mention earlier. I didn't want to tip my hand because it's so fucking crazy. Uh, Christian crossbow yoga communication. Christian crossbow yoga communication is a little known Christian mystical practice. Okay. Uh, based on memorizing, reciting certain scriptures in a chant like way. Uh, typically Psalms, totally normal, along with performing a measured breathing technique in a way that produces a deep meditative state. This shit's out there. Enhancing that state, uh, various very advanced yoga poses, such as a one-armed scorpion pose, uh, you know, and then the practitioner also, uh, you know, if they do it right, they can they can get good enough to hit targets with the crossbow while doing that. And the focus it takes to hit these targets while also meditating, while also fucking reading scripture, while also balancing on one hand, while also touching both sets of toes to the back of one's head will allow one in theory to see and talk to God. And that of course is not true. But fun for me to imagine someone, A, believing it to be true and B, actually trying to accomplish it. What a bummer. It would be to pull all that off. Like you work so fucking hard and then you don't get to talk to God. Like you put in so much work. And in the end, all you get is like a random Guinness record or a viral video or something on TikTok. Uh, No, John uh, did form most of the beliefs that would later be the foundation of his socialist utopia at Yale, including one I have not gone into yet, perfectionism. Reference it, but uh, uh, John developed his own version of the Christian notion of perfectionism there. The belief that it is possible for an individual to become free of sin entirely through religious conversion and willpower. And this is a real thing. Over the years, various teachings within Christianity have described their own particular process of achieving spiritual maturity or perfection. This concept means different things in different versions of Christianity. And it's been around for centuries. Uh, The Catholics have long had their version, uh, as have Methodists, Quakers. And these versions doesn't really mean you actually become perfect in any way. Like in the Catholic version, you can be operating in a state of being on the, on the path to perfection by continually focusing on God's word and trying your best to follow it. But you can never be 100% perfect in this life. Only in heaven can you accomplish that. Most denominations teach that you can only achieve perfection or anything remotely close to perfection uh, through death you know, by salvation. And also that you are given perfection through God's grace, not through your own work. Right, Noise uh, didn't like these versions. He was all about putting in effort down on earth that could lead directly to many heavenly things while you were still alive, like being perfect. And at Yale, John Humphrey Noyes declared himself openly, you know, around professors and friends to be perfect, to be 100% free of sin. I fucking got it. No more, no more lessons needed. Uh, you can stop reading. I'm perfect now. I'm in a state of perfection. Fuck yeah, bro. That's an alpha power move. Totally free from sin, y'all. Bask in the freaking glow. Oh, what an accomplishment. Uh, His mom must have been so proud. She must have really talked it up to her friends, right? What a great mom brag. Oh, your son's a lawyer now. (laughs) How lovely. Uh, You must be so happy. Oh yeah, my son's doing very well uh, also. He's, uh, well, feels a little weird to say it out loud, but he's he's perfect. He's literally perfect. Uh, He's more perfect and just, I don't know, so much better, I guess, than, you know, like any other mother's sons. I literally uh, just could not be more proud because he's perfect. (laughs) Clearly, uh, he got it from his mama. <laughs> uh, noise theory of perfection centered on the idea that the uh, fact that man had an independent will was because of God. Right? God gave us our will. And that since our independent will came from God, then man's will, our wills, must be divine. And because our wills are divine, well, then there's no need for the church to try and control it and interfere with it or label it sinful ever. Sounds like he just given himself a carte blanche, do whatever the fuck he wants and never be, uh, be sinful right? Just follow your will, wherever it leads. And you're just following God's will. Noise! That's some serious cult leader shit. Uh, Noise proclaimed that it was impossible for the church to compel man to obey the law of God and to send him to eternal damnation for his failure to do so. You can't condemn anyone to hell if they have God's perfect divine will. 
Um, and you know, I actually, I kind of believe in a version of this, I guess, not that we're perfect, but I, I don't believe in sin. So it's similar to that, but he's trying to still have it be within the construct of Christianity somehow. It's weird. Uh, Noyce also claimed that his new relationship to God canceled out his obligation to obey traditional moral standards <laughs> or the normal laws of society, i.e. I get to fuck any place I want. And if you're thinking this all sounds like crazy talk, well, you're right. Uh, also, uh, wouldn't everyone be perfect with this reasoning, right? So why would anyone need a co-leader? You know, we're all given our wills by God in this belief system, right? Each and every one of us. And if uh, all of our wills are already perfect and we can, you know, uh, do whatever we want with them, then how could he justify like a need for say a bunch of energy fucking uh, to bring about God's kingdom on earth? If everyone's already perfect, uh, the kingdom should already be here. And I think noise might say, yeah, kind of, but we're not immortal yet. That's where the energy sex comes in or something like that. It's hard to say. Like the teachings of a lot of cult leaders, you know, a lot of his shit is hard to interpret because it's fucking gibberish. It's like gobbledygook nonsense. Uh, Yale also thought his ideas were crazy. And in 1834, they kicked him the fuck out and they denied him a license to preach. John didn't let this sway him from his conviction and his new truth though. Wouldn't let it keep him from preaching either. He would declare, I took away their license to sin and they go on sinning. They have taken away my license to preach, but I shall go on preaching, right? I get to do what I want. That's my whole belief thing. And I got to say in moments like this, I am impressed by the balls cult leaders have, you know, the ego to push past massive ridicule, ridicule, you know, rejection, go against social norms, keep doing their own thing, keep marching to the beat of their own, you know, drum that beats often horrible and blatantly immoral, but still impressed by the fortitude it must take to carve out your own path like that, potentially a great personal cost in the face of, you know, a lot of dissent, or maybe it is less about fortitude and more about true insanity like actual mental illness. This guy's fucking crazy. We'll come out more and more as the timeline goes forward. Uh, he stayed in New Haven for a time after getting kicked out, talking to other perfectionists. Uh, you know, he wasn't the only buddy. Well, again, I talked about how it was a, an existing ideal. A lot of people this time in this area were getting into different versions of perfectionism. And uh, he talked to other social reformers, gathered more ideas for his, you know, upcoming religious visions. Uh, he became part of a small congregation of other perfectionists in New Haven. Also in 1834, John Humphrey Noyes falls in love hard. Oh man, this is going to stick with us for the rest of the episode with Abigail Merwin. God, I wish I knew what she looked like because he fell so hard. He met her at a, at a perfectionist free church in New Haven. She was the first person to publicly ally herself with him briefly after he made a surprising announcement that he's completely free from sin. Uh, she was 30. He was 22 at this time. She was hot as fuck. Uh, she is said to have been, uh, you know, very beautiful, dark hair and eyes. Uh, he wanted her real bad. She will become the inspiration for most of his future insanity in one way or another. From February of 1834 until May of 1834, uh, they met often to discuss how to launch a perfectionist preaching campaign. Uh, she was also the first person he converted to his uh, new religious views. Uh, and he lusted after her so intensely. But, you know, at the time he didn't really have a job. And if he wanted to try and make her his wife, you know, per se, uh, he would have to build a name for himself. So he left, you know, New Haven for New York City in the spring of 1834. And this trip did not go well for him, relationship-wise. It did not, uh, absence did not make the heart grow far fonder in this situation. Abigail will quickly break off the potential for romance when Noyes loses his fucking mind in a big way, in the Big Apple. Like almost all co-leaders, he receives a vision, a bunch of visions, actually. He's staying in a small, cheap boarding house on Leonard Street in a rough area of lower Manhattan known as the infamous Five Points neighborhood. Uh, known previously as the Collect. There was once a five-acre lake in the area called the Collect that had become a swampy cesspool due to industrial waste from unregulated nearby factories and waste from slaughterhouses. And then the lake was drained, a low-income neighborhood built where it once was. And now the neighborhood riddled with crime and vice, probably the biggest prostitution center in the nation at that time. Uh, the same year uh, that no Noy stayed there, hoping to write a new book explaining all his new religious ideas, frontiersman Davy Crockett, Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Uh, he actually wrote a travel memoir recording his experience in Five Points, commenting, I would rather not venture among these creatures after night. They are too mean to swab hell's kitchen. Shit was rugged. Uh, and while staying in his room there, overlooking a street full of sex workers, gamblers, hard party, and whiskey drinkers, Noise lost his fucking mind or had a vision. Uh, the first of many that will last for around three weeks, the length of what seems to have been a serious mental breakdown. He will later describe his first vision to a friend as a marriage feast with Christ. He wrote a blow-by-blow -blow description of a wedding night with the Son of God, one abounding in sexual metaphors, not weird at all. After it was over, the vision left Noise pining like a ravished bride, he said, for the lover whose fruit was sweet to his taste. Okay, talked about God entering his secret chamber. All right, 
Oh, it sounds like some blue pollen going on there and having a sexual hangover the next morning. Seems like being around a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sex work while also thinking about God a lot, while also being a horny dude, while maybe being mentally ill, led him to having a weird fever dream of sorts where he gets fucked by Jesus or something. Uh, he later wrote that the uh, day after his vision, now Satan showed up. Oh, no. And his minions tried to get him. No, Satan. Uh-uh. Get out of here. Wait, what are you doing here? Come on. Not today. No. To He's surrounded now by a dark energy. Uh, and he lets, uh, he lets everyone know all this stuff happens. Uh, by writing a bunch of letters <laughs> during this uh, brief bout of insanity, total insanity to his parents, friends, uh, Abigail. Uh, for three weeks, he wanders around the streets of Five Points, sometimes seeing God, sometimes seeing the devil, often not returning to his room for days. Uh, sometimes talking to angels, sometimes talking to demons. Uh, he's sleeping on benches, preaching to drunken gamblers and prostitutes, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, in, in one vision, the girl who dumped him, Abigail, uh, reveals herself to be an agent of Satan, disguised as an angel, and he has to harden his heart against her. Be gone, Lucifina. Uh, one morning, he convinces himself that Christ is returning right now. He fucking runs out, literally stands on the street, stares into the sky for apparently hours. Uh, instead of thinking <laughs> he'd lost his mind for a bit when he comes out of all this, he interprets all this as God testing him and he passes. And now he is ready to be God's chosen prophet. Cult, cult, cult. After all this, he returns to his family in Putney and they are not impressed. They're concerned and ashamed. Apparently his dad is uh, demoralized, completely convinced his son's lost his mind because he had. And, uh, you know, he's now worried that his son's never going to amount to anything. Mom is uh, confused and embarrassed. It's not a good homecoming. Old friends avoid him like the plague. He's the subject of all kinds of gossip. He's the talk of the town. And a month or so after showing up, uh, he leaves. He returns to New Haven to stay with some free church friends who get him. Back in New Haven, he and another free church buddy, James Boyle, fellow perfectionist, start printing a paper called uh, The Perfectionist. Bear, straightforward. First issue printed in August of 1834. Shortly after this first issue, he uh, hears about another perfectionist church in Salina, New York, where the preacher Erasmus Stone is telling his congregation that they can have spiritual marriages with partners outside their legal marriages. Okay, I'm interested. Publicly, Stone is preaching that these partnerships are only about praying together, learning about God's word together, nothing physical. But rumors soon start to flow that these people actually are fucking each other. And that gets Johnny Sex Noise's wheels a spinning. He starts to get some more interesting ideas. In 1835, he hears about Abigail again. He no longer thinks she's one of Satan's minions, or he does think she still is, but her ass looks so good, he's willing to burn in hell just to get a little piece of it. I get it. Hell is Fina. Uh, he does hear about her. He hears she's gotten engaged and he is devastated, even though they have not spoken since he left for New York or since shortly after he left for New York. Uh, he now decides totally rationally that sometimes even when you don't get the partner you want in this life, you do get him later in heaven. Uh, you know, like, like you literally get to fuck him up in heaven once you're both dead. <laughs> fuck yeah, bro. He decides that Abigail is his spiritual wife. And while yes, he wants her, he lusts after her in this life. If he doesn't get her in this life, oh well, he'll get to make love to her. In heaven, because God promised it in another vision. When we're, you know, God told him he gets to have her in heaven. What a solid, rational, stable mind this guy has. I think a bunch of you listening should have so much fun with this concept. Hear me out. Play a super fun joke on some people. Here's what you do. You reach out to some exes or one ex, you know, whatever, who's broken up with you or divorced you, or you reach out to someone who professed, uh, you professed your love to them and they never reciprocated that love. And you tell them that, hey, yeah, you might not get to, you know, fuck him in this life ever, you know, or ever again, but you just want him to know that you are going to fuck him so much once they're dead. I just want you to try it and see how it goes. I bet they won't find it creepy at all. They won't report you to the authorities. Uh, I think everyone will have a good laugh. Everyone will think that you're clever and fun. Uh, report back. Let us know what happens. As crazy as this is, Noise did this. He actually wrote Abigail a letter <laughs> saying as much. Holy shit, he declared in his letter to Abigail that he had shuffled off the mortal coil of earthly cares and would be, content, uh, would be content to possess her in heaven. Wow. I'm sure she was flattered. I'm sure she didn't start, you know, like double checking that the doors uh, are locked at night, you know, anything like that. Uh, not sure if she wrote back or not. I don't think she did. But Noyes did learn later that her marriage is uh, delayed not long after writing this letter. And he decides to, uh, you know, do the right thing, do the normal, rational thing. And he moves to Ithaca, New York, where she's living in January of 1837. Still wants her on earth. As you can imagine, she's not happy about this. She doesn't want him back. When he finds her in Ithaca, 
uh, where she is from, by the way, and where her family is, she literally refuses to acknowledge him on the street, turns away from him, won't say a word to him. I'm sure he freaked her the fuck out because he's a weird creep. And her family, familiar with his meltdown in New York because the letter he sent to her, they, you know, want him to stay the fuck away from his, from their daughter. This guy's not stable. In the midst uh, of another, of, of intense emotional turmoil now about losing the one person he felt he was destined to love. He has another mini breakdown. He has some more visions. Uh, he suppresses his personal sense of loss, focuses instead on his uh, uh, guiding principle in life, creating a perfectionist heaven on earth now. We are such an interesting species. Right now, some of our brains work. Uh, he writes a friend, fellow perfectionist, David Harrison, a letter on January 15th that'll become infamous. When the will of God is done on earth, that is, this is a little excerpt of it, not all of it. When the will of God is done on earth, as it is in heaven, there will be no marriage. Exclusiveness, jealousy, quarreling, have no place at the marriage supper of the lamb. God has placed a wall of partition between man and woman during the apostasy. For good reasons. This partition will be broken down in the resurrection for equally good reasons. But woe to him who abolishes the law of the apostasy before he stands in the holiness of the resurrection. I call a certain woman my wife. She is yours. She is Christ's. And in him, she is the bride of all saints. She is now in the hands of a stranger. And according to my promise to her, I rejoice. My claim upon her cuts directly across the marriage covenant of this world. And God knows the end. See what he's doing here? Frustrated by jealousy over having to share Abigail with an earthly husband. And he's not sharing her because she doesn't fucking want anything to do with him. Noise now invents a system in which exclusiveness is banned. Everyone is married to everyone. If he can't eliminate his rival, Abigail's fiance, Merritt Platt, in his crazy ass mind, he will eliminate the very notion of sexual rivalry altogether. Game, set, match. Uh, how wild that the whole compound in, in Oneida <laughs> would have probably just been avoided, would have never happened if this one lady would have just agreed to fuck him. How crazy. There would never be Oneida flatware if Abigail Merwin would have just fucking let John Humphrey Noyes put his dick in back in 1837. <sighs> Johnny Sex Noyes also declares in this letter that he is one of the true leaders of the, well, actually not leaders, plural, sorry, that he is the true leader of the perfectionists. Another alpha move. He writes, uh, uh, you know, it's very radical for 1837. Uh, to the vast majority of both American men and women, free love was unthinkable. It was a total rejection of America's puritanical roots. America was founded by people who believed that nothing was more important than family. Right? You know, I, I, I share uh, this belief to an extent. Uh, you fight, you know, for your country to protect your family at the end of the day. You settle new land to provide a better future for your family. The American dream is about not to just improve your life, but the lives of future generations of your family. And noise is shredding the notion of family up and just throwing in the trash. This concept not only shook the overwhelming majority of America's views about what constituted a stable society to its core, it would, it would have been turned uh, immoral, adulterous, satanic even. To soften the message he's delivering, John Noyes uh, won't use the term free love. Uh, that was too alarming. No, instead, he'll call it complex marriage. That's smart. That's a good branding decision, right? This isn't something wildly different from what you've known. No way. This isn't a rejection of what society's built on. It's just a little twist on the same old shit, right? You're still married. We still believe in marriage. Of course we do. But now marriage has just gotten, you know, it's a bit more complex. Uh, Noise would actually criticize free love as wrong because he said that it inspired sexual pairing, which no matter how godly, couldn't replace marriage. Interesting. Instead, in his complex marriages, all the women in the community were wives of all the men and all the men in the community were husbands of all the women. Uh, you know, it was the fairest way to do it, says the guy working so hard to create a world where Abigail Merwin will finally have to fuck him. Uh, but what about the children? Noise knew that there would be backlash regarding the children. Wasn't it wrong for them to grow up not knowing you know, who their fathers were. Noise has a fix for this. Sex relations with everyone were only permissible in his new fucking concept. As long as there is a mutual agreement that men will practice coitus reservatus, aka sex with no coming. So as to avoid unwanted and unplanned pregnancy, right? So easy. This is like the birth control version of the is we dumb joke of just don't. I'm going to come. <laughs> no, just don't. Oh, okay. Forget about it. Never mind. <laughs> I won't then. Uh, childbearing would be a community decision based on selective breeding decided by basically noise and a eugenics committee of his everyone got to use it got to use everyone else's holes or you know or sticks for fun but only some holes and sticks get to be matched for childbearing and i guess all the guys had to pinky swear just to never let any cum slip out of their clean wings or something it's easy peasy this all sounds like a pretty sweet gig for a guy uh who wants to fuck a lot uh you know but uh, doesn't want to be burdened by uh, fatherhood 
You know, just, oh, what? Oh, man, I don't get to be part of breeding? Oh, bummer. I only get to fuck everyone all the time for fun? Dang it, I'm so sad. I guess I'll have to go drown my sorrows in so much puss. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. A uh, noise letter talking about all this shit uh, would set off a crazy chain of events. It had a strong impact on Harrison, uh, who sent it to a friend, Simon Lovett. Lovett would then show the letter to one Elizabeth Hawley, a young perfectionist firebrand, who would then insist upon having it sent again to perfectionist preacher uh, Theophilus R. Gates of Philadelphia. And this takes us on a fun adventure. Uh, by August 1837, Noise's letter is on the cover of the second edition of Gates' broadsheet called The Battle Axe and Weapons of War. Gates would go on to lead his own small group of uh, group lovers. Now, his group would become basically the poor man's version of the United Community. Uh, the backwoods version. This is so good. Earlier in 1837, Gates had uh, converted to perfectionism, moved to Philadelphia. He'd come to believe that in the end days... Uh, or that the end days, excuse me, were fast approaching, right? Okay, happens all the time. And it's necessary to break down many mistaken human, human social practices before God shows up, especially the concept of marriage and the concept of falling in love, which he called an enchantment of the devil. He was another fucking weirdo. In place of marriage, Gates preached a total spontaneous and flexible sexual arrangement between men and women. And Noyes' uh, letter, you know, can confirm this to him, that he's right. His ideas are the right ideas. Uh, you know, or I guess it wasn't a letter to him, but you know, he gets, he sees this letter. But so by 1840, Gates and a new, uh, and, a, and a few followers, excuse me, move west of Philadelphia to a rural Northern Chester, move, God dang, move west of Philadelphia to rural Northern Chester County. That's how you talk near Pottstown where they took up residence in the Shankles Valley, an area they renamed free love Valley. And they called themselves battle axers. There's only a small number of battle axers. Sounds like somewhere between 10 and 20. They had no set codes of conduct, no formal liturgy. Doesn't seem to have been a set time or location for their meetings or services. Uh, why would there be, right? They were already all perfect. All they needed to do was follow their divine, perfect wills in that valley. And those wills, <laughs> wouldn't you know it, led them to a lot of fucking. Anecdotal records reveal that the group, uh, you know, engaged in a lot of uh, basically constant nudity. They wanted to emulate the pure state of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, you know. And uh, when they had services... Whatever those entailed, probably a lot of shouts of, you're perfect. <laughs> I know. You're perfect too. I know. And a lot of high fives. And then the services would, I guess, typically end. <laughs> with, I love this so much. This might, might be my favorite thing in this episode. It would typically end with a nude procession. I picture almost like a, like a New Orleans kind of parade. You know, like they're, bum, 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 bum. they're just like walking down this trail to a, a nearby pond. And then they would have an orgy in the pond. God, I love this topic so much today. Uh, that's how you get people to, uh, you know, uh, embrace a religion, ladies and gentlemen. Pond orgies. Hail Lucifina. Woo! Uh, or maybe not. Unless the people at the pond orgy look like a lot of the people I've seen at church over the course of my life. <laughs> oh my heck. Gosh dang. Uh, in that case, you might end up with a real small congregation. A real, uh, there's, not, there's no nice way to say this. A less than super hot congregation attending some pond fuck sermons. Might end up with a small band of dedicated mudfuckers, people surrounded by frogs who also kind of look like frogs. Oh boy, 19th century religious group fucking a pond. That is one porno I don't think I ever need to see, but I would watch it once if it was available. You know I would. I'm curious. You probably are too. I don't know if I'd be able to finish, but who knows? Maybe I'd surprise myself. Realize that group, you know, pond fucking is a new, strong sexual interest of mine. Uh, I think it'd be hard to get Lindsay to join in on that interest. Uh, she doesn't seem like uh, she'd be down with a lot of a lot of group pond fucking. I just love that this actually happened. Uh, it didn't take long for this behavior, as you might imagine, to attract some outside attention. When you go heavy on pond fucking, word gets around. Four battle axers get arrested for fornication and adultery at the beginning of 1843. Neighbors probably complain, you know, they don't want to see or hear any more heated pond fucks. Why do I keep picturing uh, some toad-like lady being sexually shish by two other pond folk? Some elderly bearded men with bellies bigger than mine, but arms and legs so much skinnier. While doing the back float in a dirty ass pond. And why do I also picture a toad on her belly as she's being rocked back and forth in the, in the passionate heat of religious sexual pond fucking passion? What's wrong with me? Uh, three of those pond fuckers were actually convicted and sent to prison. Uh, during these proceedings, Battle Axe followers chose to disrupt the, uh, the Schenkel Church during the Sunday service by marching nude. Right, they're protesting. They marched nude down the main aisle, waving their arms around, crying out against the established order. Uh, what a scene! Oh, the gossip that must have surrounded all this. They made things lively in that valley. Uh, the small group of people hung around, were arrested off and on, uh, tossed out of area churches here and there. 
sometimes literally, uh, while nude, uh, until he finally headed out to the Wild West and disappeared from the historical record in the 1850s. <laughs> this faded, just kind of literally faded off into the sunset. And that was the end of the Battle Axe community. Uh, no word on how many kids, if any, were conceived from those pond fucks. I'm not sure, but I do think that the origin story of Swamp Thing from DC Comics is connected to those orgies and at least one run of that awesome character and a couple of those uh, Appalachian cryptids I talked about last month, right? A couple of those Bigfoot derivatives. I mean, they have to have been spawned from those pond fuckers, you know, walking through Appalachia on their way out west. Uh, definitely that sad little squonk monster, right? Related to those folk. Uh, back to Noise's letter. Although it was published anonymously by the Battle Axers, Noise did quickly admit, okay, I, I did it. I'm the author. He later said he felt that God intended his private thoughts to be made public because they were so good. And from that point on, uh, he'd say that he felt that he was called to defend and ultimately carry out the doctrine of biblical communism in regards to carnal love. He had to. God's will, God's will be done. Despite continual rejections, Noise is uh, still pining away for Abigail. He won't let it go. March 23rd, 1838. He writes another letter. To his friend, David Harrison, he writes, dear brother, with respect to Abigail, I say still, God knows the end. He just, he can't, he can't help himself. I do not. Many things strongly indicate that the end is not far off. My mind concerning her has not changed, save that I love her more and more. Oh boy. And am daily more fully persuaded of God that she is worthy and in due time will be proved so, though I have long reconciled to suspense. I desire to know the, know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in relation to her, whatever it may be. If you see her, <laughs> you are authorized to make known to her my mind and circumstances as far as you know them, leaving her and the Lord to determine what course it is right and expedient for her to pursue. If God does not bring to pass her strange act by her or his strange act by her, he will buy someone else soon. Okay. The kingdom of God is swiftly advancing to its predicted collision with the kingdoms of this world. Like two mighty ships, they are coming to crash, which will shatter and sink one of them. The timbers then must bear the blow an expected crushing shock. Okay. Uh, dude, if I got a letter from a fucking or stock like that or heard about it, <laughs> I would notify the police immediately. No one wants his friends to tell her, hey, if you see her, just tell her that I, uh, I, th- I think about her. I know, I know the last few times have been rough. I know her family wants me to never, ever speak to her again. I know she refuses to even look at me. But if you could just talk to her about how God wants me to fuck her when we're dead. And I'd rather start that during life. It just, <laughs> just see what she says. Uh, noise continues to be crazy. The spring of 1838. Now he's back home in Putney. Family not happy. He's a complete embarrassment. Uh, speaking to a small group of fellow lunatics on April 5th, uh, Noise expounds more on his insanity. He will say, and I'm leaving a lot of stuff out because it's boring. Uh, I believe that marriage does not exist in heaven. Okay, yeah, we've talked about that. I believe that the will of God will be done on earth that it is done in heaven. Consequently, the time will come when marriage will not exist on earth. He's real big on abolishing marriage. You know, no marriage is in heaven, I will say, uh, does make sense though. Everyone being married to each other does not, Right. You know, earthly marriages, you know, make sense, but then it's, you know, it's till death do you apart. Cause, uh, otherwise, you know, uh, why are people like, well, you know, when a spouse, you know, passes, why would they ever get, you know, married again? Right. If that happened and then what happens in this, in this kind of world, when you, when you die, let's say you've been married like three times and then you show up in heaven. Well, I guess what now you have to be in a polygamous marriage up there or I don't know. He also says, I believe that such as make these doctrines, a cloak of licentiousness are wholly ignorant of the true nature of the doctrines and will share the doom of Sodom and Gomorrah. I think what he's doing here is flipping the script. I think he's like, oh, you don't think pond orgies are holy? Well, get ready to be smited. You totally missed the message on Sodom and Gomorrah. God didn't hate how much wanton fucking was going on there. He was mad that more wanton fucking and sucking wasn't happening. How'd you miss that? Uh, one more. I believe that such as impede the true tendency of these doctrines by misrepresenting them and trusting in written laws instead of the Holy Spirit are also wholly ignorant of the subjects they handle. And will ere long be found fighting against God. Wake up, idiots. You're part of Satan's lot. God wants you to use your genitals so much. We got all these stupid rules about who you're supposed to be able to fuck. Uh Uh-uh. God wants you to fuck everyone. Syphilis be damned. Just fuck it out if you get a case. Nothing cures syphilis like righteous fucking. Sorry. I think that's what he's saying there again. It's hard to tell what he's talking about sometimes. Uh, By the summer of 1838, Noise has given up on winning Abigail back. Kind of, not really. Uh, He writes a short poem. Another poem. It signifies change of heart. So I guess, you know, he is still longing for it. You don't, you know, you don't write a poem about somebody you really just don't care about at all. Uh, he's 26 years old now, by the way. Writing a poem about the girl who won't requite your love. That seems a little, a little high school. If this guy had only lived, uh, you know, a century and a half later. Maybe he, uh, instead of being like a cult leader, he would have been the front man for an emo band. Here is his uh, new, uh, sad, shitty poem. 
Well, I will not give you back your heart. I'm wooed and fairly won it. And soon with my life all part, you may depend upon it. <laughs> you say your heart is still your own, but words will never prove it. What God and you and I have done will stand the world can't move it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, that music is fitting because this guy is a clown. I know it's distracting. You know what? Here's here's something better. I think that I think this will make it work a little more appropriate. So go on your way and I'll go mine. I care not where you wander. The branches roots are in the vine. They'll never be torn asunder. We'll meet again. Be sure of that. Sometime twixt now and never. At age two, I will may wait since we are one forever. I, uh, I know that song also doesn't fit the time period, but I, I do think it kind of works for the lyrics. You know? Uh, after sending in this poem, 26-year-old Noise attempts to propose to a young woman named Harriet Holton, also 26 years old, uh, a recent perfectionist convert in June of 1838. But he's not really over Abigail. Of course he's not. In his letter to Harriet, he's still talking about her. <laughs> he says, You are doubtless aware to some extent of my relations to Abigail Merwin. I will only say concerning her at present that I have recently been released from any connection with her which could interfere with my proposal to you. My present relations to her are only such as exist between all believers by the primary bond of which I wrote on the first page and involve no external obligation. I still believe her to be a child of God and therefore love her. Yet I am as free as I as if I had never seen her. He's such a fucking stalker lunatic. Abigail has not been speaking to him for four fucking years at this point and they barely knew each other. <laughs> Despite his troublesome longing for Abigail, uh, Harry does accept. She also accepts an open marriage, writing back. In gladly accepting this proposal for an external union, I agree with you that it will not limit the range of our affections. The grace of God will exclude jealousy and, and everything with which the marriage state is defiled. As we see in the world, I only expect by it to be placed in a situation where I can enjoy your society and instruction as long as the Lord pleases and when he pleases. This open marriage shit uh, will soon get him into some trouble. Uh, June 28, 1838, John Noyes and Harriet Holton get married in Chesterfield, New Hampshire, just 13 miles up the road from Putney. Noyes' brother-in-law performs a ceremony. Noyes then takes his bride immediately to his father's home at Putney and is allowed to live there. I think his parents uh, at this point are glad that it is, you know, as long as he's, he has, he's still a weirdo, but at least he's a married weirdo now. In the following year, they build a house of their own. An inheritance his wife brings to the marriage enables him to uh, uh, buy a printing press and they decide to uh, reprint in book form the 20 articles Noise had previously written for the New Haven Perfectionist. How wonderful. Everybody needs to hear these things. Uh, their next undertaking is to start up Noise's newspaper, The Witness. Uh, Noise spent the next eight months printing books and pamphlets for the Putney community, and it does not win him a lot of converts. But a few do fall for his crazy bullshit. Uh, most surprising, Mama. He wore her down. His dad must have been so pissed. March of 18, or 1839, Polly's testimony is published in The Witness. Uh, Mama says, I have never doubted my first, though I have never doubted my first confession of salvation from sin, yet during the past year, I've expressed to different members of the church an expectation that I might again return to them. I am now delivered from the doubt and darkness that then oppressed me and am determined to follow what I know to be the truth. Let what will be the consequence. It is true. I've been led through fire and flood, especially the last year. But the suffering and separation which I have endured were the only way in which I could prove to myself that I am not governed by parental partiality and self-exaltation in the testimony which I now give to John H. Noyes, as being to me a teacher and father in spiritual things. Oh, boy. Uh, Mom now truly does believe that baby boy is perfect. This becomes a touchstone in the Putney and Oneida communities, the idea that John Noyes is the ultimate leader who has never sinned. Kind of like Jesus. Uh, those who rejected it were turned away. Those who accepted it were bound together in a brotherhood of self-sacrificing quest for the kingdom of God. Cult, cult, cult. Of course, I can show you the way I am perfect. If only fucking Abigail and her also perfect puss could see that. Uh, two years later, John's dad dies in 1841 at the age of 77. Maybe of old age, maybe of shame, maybe of embarrassment. Uh, also in the early 1840s, things not going well in Noises marriage. In the first six years of the marriage, Harriet gives birth five times. Four of the five births are premature. Only one of their children survives, this poor woman. And poor John. I could have, uh, I'm could. i sure that didn't help his already fragile mind. Uh, these life experiences lead Noise to begin a further exploration of the study of sexual intercourse and marriage. And his self-guided studies will, of course, lead to more insanity later on. All that electric immortality sex shit. 
Uh, by 1844, Noyes decides to live separately from his wife. He claims the separation brings satisfaction that neither he nor, nor his wife had ever experienced before. In 1846, John Humphrey Noyes figures out uh, that we can all fuck our way into immortality. This is the big year. That's how you bring the kingdom of God to earth, for sure. This year, he develops an elaborate theological and biological argument that places sexual intercourse at the very heart of the Christian community. He made sex the secret to humanity's ability to conquer death. He wrote that when the invisible world of the saints came to annex the earthly saints, a.k.a. Noise, and his followers, and no one else, to Christ's heavenly kingdom, all of its members would enjoy everlasting life, as promised in the book of Revelation. He wrote that there was a physiological mechanism involved in immortality, discoverable through patient scientific inquiry, i.e. lots of fucking studies, uh, which humans could perfect on their end in order to meet God halfway to resurrection. By studies, I meant fucking. Drawing on the fields of biology, chemistry, and physiology, Noyes tries to link sex to immortality through the little understood, apparently magical workings of electricity. And that's why I went with that Frankenstein example earlier. According to Noyes, Christ possessed an invisible energy, a battery of nervous power. Christ had electricity inside of him. And the healing power of Jesus' electricity was it passed from him as electricity. Oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't quite electricity. It was a fluid, fluid form. It was a fluid which passed from him as electricity passes from the machine that generates it. He wrote, our life can become charged with the life of Christ till it is magnetic like his life. When we are open to being plugged into Christ, <laughs> kind of, uh, not literally, but it's, it's weird. We receive the equivalent of the shocks of the galvanic fluid accumulating chronic magnetic power in our life and assimilation to Christ. He believed this life force could be passed from person to person through the exchange of words, ideas, healing touches, but mostly highest form spiritual interchange, which according to his magnetic theory was, you know, dick and puss. Man and woman, he said, were like magnet and steel and were attracted to each other and naturally advanced to interlocked contact. He wrote that freed from the artificial restrictions of the worldly fashion of chaining one man to one woman, the union of male and female would fold into the original God-Jesus battery and <laughs> find its effect. Are you following me? This is how you get your partner to let you fuck other people or how you get them to leave you forever because you're crazy. Energy begat energy, according to Noyce. And in the fullness of time, when God's kingdom was extended on earth, each individual life would be enfolded within every other and the whole of human life would be enfolded into God and Christ, forming, quote, one glowing sphere and a battery of inconceivable power. I picture him uh, when he's developing, standing in front of like a big ass chalkboard. He's got a fucking lab coat on and he's just, oh, he's exhausted. He hasn't slept working on all these ideas, uh, you know, just writing things on the board, constantly erasing things. And instead of like a, a bunch of high level theoretical like math equations on the chalkboard, it, it's just like a little bit of math, uh, just like, like some basic addition and subtraction. And then just like lots of pictures of dicks <laughs> and just boobs and pussies and, and then like lightning bolts. And then like a guy, a guy being like, ah, yeah, maybe like a little picture of Jesus and stuff. Uh, he said that all the sex could fuse into one gigantic divine sex battery and that humans could accumulate enough electrical force <laughs> to overcome death itself. Victory over death, he theorized, will be, will, will be the result of an action of an extensive battery of this kind. He taught that the heat and light generated by this condensed sexual energy chain, <laughs> my God, he's crazy, uh, would produce a kind of temperate microclimate that would conquer disease and death. <laughs> we, we fuck our way into a healing climate change. When life shall accumulate in unity by the centripetal force of love, he said, till all hearts shall radiate and receive a perpetual sunshine of joy, it is not unphilosophical to believe that the substantial physical results of an actual amelioration of climate shall be achieved. Warmed from the inside out by this mega battery, life will become independent of external elements and death will lose its prey. So, uh, so yeah, that was, a, that was a whole bunch of crazy gibberish. Uh, that sounds like something conspiracists David Icke would put together. I imagine him presenting this in a, in sermon form to a small, very confused and, and mostly silent congregation, right? And then when he's done, you know, he's like, uh, does anyone have any questions about any of this? And literally every dude listening quickly raises their hands. And then when he calls on any of the dudes, you know, uh, you know, they, they just say, you know, whoever he calls on. So, um, uh, so uh, do we get to have lots of sex with uh, different ladies? And he's like, uh, yes, Michael Adiah. Uh, that is correct. And then Michael Adai just lets loose like a Ric Flair, like a, woo, I love it. Praise Jesus, amen. And then all the guys immediately stop holding their hands up for questions, fucking high-fiving, fist pumping, you know, doing pelvic thrusts facing the female members. Uh, so what does John's mom think of all this? I don't think she knew about it all yet. He didn't tell all of his followers immediately, just some, just the inner circle, right? So the rest, they weren't quite ready for this message. And then he and his inner circle get to doing a lot of fucking each other for God's kingdom, Halo Sphina. 
and then they will get in trouble for doing that. Uh, October 26, 1847, Noyes is arrested for adultery, which is funny that that was a you know a crime that they would arrest you for, uh, but then is released until his trial before the county court in April next, according to a community member's October 29th, 1847 letter to her mother. Uh, Noyes, knowing he was guilty, now he wants to get the fuck out of town. Upon receiving word that arrest warrants have been issued for several of his loyal followers as well, the group flees Vermont for Oneida, New York, where Noyes knows uh, some friendly fellow perfectionists that have some land there, and mother comes along. And some siblings to a group fuck home. Seriously, that's so, that's so creepy. If I ever try and launch a fuck compound, mom not getting an invite. Neither is any other relative. Sorry, fam. You, you don't need to see this. Uh, these weirdos promised land, uh, you know, was near the Canadian border, which would, would, of course, be convenient in case of a future prosecution. It was here that the Putney group agreed that the kingdom of God had come. 45 of his followers from Putney follow Noyes to Oneida. By the end of uh, 1848, their membership grows to 87, right? They double quickly. They settle, build their first communal dwelling, 1848. Uh, In 1862, they will later build a much larger communal home, which they will call the Mansion House. Still stands today. I'll talk more about it later. But for now, this thing uh, would, after numerous additions, be 93,000 square feet. Massive. Uh, Had 250 small rooms. For all its members to sleep in or sneak off and fuck a little bit and, you know, charge your batteries and stuff. Uh, the soul of the United community resides in the second floor big hall of this place, or used to, where the adults would gather after dinner each night for evening meetings. Ornate, uh, this ornate two-story hall would feature figures depicting justice, music, astronomy, and history. In place of stained glass and a pulpit, the o- Oneidans built a stage backlit by three tall velvet curtain windows for noise to give his sermons and share his wisdom. Every evening, community members might hear a home talk from their leader. Make decisions about business affairs, enjoy a concert by the community's musicians, uh, air grievances through mutual criticism shit. Yeah, it gets wild here. Uh, in the year after first getting going in 1848, uh, the community purchases and cultivates additional land, establishes a variety of minor craft industries for income, uh, precursors to flatware, appoints administrative committees, sets up a pattern of daily living, which the community will follow for the next 30 years. This is how the Oneida community is born. In the following decades, the community will grow to a membership of just over 300 with much smaller and short-lasting branch communities also in Brooklyn, New York, uh, Wallingford, Connecticut, Newark, New Jersey, Cambridge, Vermont, and Putney, Vermont. Uh, Most of these branch communities will quickly fade or be folded into the Oneida community. Now, the community supported itself through several successful industries. They initially manufactured animal traps, silk thread, uh, grew and canned fruits and vegetables. Smaller industries included the manufacture of leather travel bags, palm leaf hats, their most successful trade, you know, would of course be silverware, but that won't come until after all the electric sex shit's long gone. Uh, let's dig more into Noise's complex marriage now, and how it worked in Oneida, uh, where it really took off. In his complex marriage, every man was married to every woman and vice versa, but he didn't get to fuck someone if they didn't want to fuck you. There were some guidelines, thank God, at least two. Uh, the first was that before the man and woman could cohabitate, uh, you know, they had to obtain each other's consent through a third person or persons as witnesses. Uh, Secondly, no two people could have exclusive attachment with each other because it would be selfish and idolatrous. Oh, any two people found in such a situation would be separated and not allowed to see each other for a length of time decided by a committee led by noise. Overly devoted relationships were called sticky relationships and being sticky was icky. It was bad. Being sticky meant that you were being selfish by preferring one person over another, even though we're hardwired to find some people more attractive than others. Uh, Might not be fair, but it is natural. Uh, you know, this plan obviously going against uh, nature here. Uh, to make sure sticky relationships didn't happen, private rooms for sexual intercourse were bare and uncomfortable, while public spaces were luxurious and heavily decorated. I doubt that would work that well. And if two people really, like especially two young people, you know, really wanted to fuck each other, they're going to fuck on a pile of dirt, you know, rather than not fuck and hang out on a comfy couch around other people or something. Uh, another teaching practice at Oneida was, uh, of course, male continence, the old coitus reservatus. Oh boy, sex without coming. Uh, The only allowed form of birth control at Oneida. Guys weren't even supposed to come after sex was over. Don't ever ever jerk off. Why? Because that's how you lose sex electricity. Wake up, idiots. The main reason that humanity is not currently immortal is because too many dudes are out there fucking beating off all the time. Forget about Oneida. It pisses me off. Here I am, horny as fuck all the time, bottling up my magic penis Jesus electricity juice and everyone else shooting it into socks and stomachs and shower floors and onto their pet's fur, you know, and stuff all willy nilly, right? <laughs> That's where it goes. Everybody, come on. Uh, the pet's fur part was meant to be absurd. You know that. Come on. 
I'm weird, but I'm not that weird. Uh, the old blue ball method of birth control here. Not good for birth control, uh, not good for your health, and not good for morale. Uh, this might be dumber than Provo Floatin or Poopo Loopolin. Poopo Loopolin. Uh, I can't believe they pulled this off for, for you know, decades. I'm guessing this rule was broken a lot. Also, noise likes his followers to get started, uh, you know, adding to the sexual electricity bank early on. Noise felt that sex limited to traditional Christian marriage practices left most young people facing sexual starvation from puberty, which according to Noise was from the age of 14 uh, until the typical age of marriage, which was about 24. What a clever way for him to rationalize fucking 14-year-olds. Why are we sexually starving the children, these poor teens? Why should they not sexually eat when right here, right here in my pants, for example, I have a hard dick that I'm not even using. That they can munch on. Let the children eat. Uh, however, uh, Noise was worried about these uh, these young teens, the boys at least, not being able to not come when they started having sex. He was worried about some uh, amateur hour pregnancies. So to solve this problem, he decides that young men in his community, <laughs> this might even be more ridiculous than this shit I've already covered. He decides that the young men in his community should have a lot of practice sex with women in the community who have already gone through menopause. And only these women until they can control their ejaculations. <laughs> and yes, I am wondering now if he assigned young teen boys to fuck his mom. Of course, I'm thinking that. It's very possible. But I don't know for sure because a lot of the records of exactly who fucked who in this group were eventually burned by his descendants, uh, you know, once it became a Civil War Titan business, you know, because this all embarrassed the shit out of him. Uh, interestingly, the practice of male continents did seem to work pretty well as far as birth control went. Uh, from 1848 to 1868, when records were taken of this, uh, only, uh, you know, some 40 kids were born in the community of about 250 people on average. It seems all those births were planned, so they claimed. Uh, after 1868, there's just no records of how many kids were born, uh, you know, during that last 10-year stretch. Another odd sexual teaching practice uh, along these same lines was called Ascending Fellowship. This one equally creepy, that last one. Uh, ascending Fellowship was Noise's uh, process of introducing female virgins into complex marriage. He justified this practice in a few ways. One was to prevent young members from falling in love with one another and from limiting their range of affection to just the younger members, right? Because you got to remember, he, he's doing all of this stuff for them and for God. The males, you know, uh, picked, you know, the the to, to care for female virgins, or yeah, the males, um, excuse me, the males who were picked to, you know, introduce female virgins to sex were the men noise considered to be closest to God. These people were, of course, mostly himself. And then also his older male friends called central members by the group. You know, so typical. Once again, older male cult leader twists religious teachings uh, around until he is supposed to fuck young women and girls. It's what God wants. You know, if he can't have Abigail, he will drown his tears in young puss. Uh, Typically in this system of ascending fellowship, an elder male member would pick any female virgin of his choice. And due to her lower order in terms of some complex leadership hierarchy they had, she was compelled to accept. So much, this is so fucked up. So much social pressure for her to accept. If she does not, Literally, everyone she knows is mad at her. And they think she is going against God's literal will. Oh, cult, cult, cult. Uh, Noise justified this practice by saying that only he and a few other men had the skills and self-control, right? Dick control, necessary to participate in sexual intercourse with young women of this community. Because again, he's doing this for the kids. <laughs> he's teaching young teen girls how to have sex. And, uh, and he will do this up until his mid-60s uh, for the good of the community. He's pumping away, maybe not coming, probably lying about coming in order to make everyone immortal. Thank you, John Humphrey Noyce, for your immense sacrifice. Uh, In the reverse, young men and older women, uh, men also still did the choosing. So all the women in this group are being selected by the dudes, ages 14 and up for, you know, constant fucking. According to Noyce, sexual intercourse was communal. It was based on consent and all sexual unions documented and regulated. At one point, they had fucking log books, I guess, of all this kind of stuff. Sexual intercourse was spiritual. Uh, the pairing of man and woman for sexual intercourse in the community had to be approved by a committee. Although somehow, uh, most of the fe- virgin females of the community always seemed to end up reserved for Noyce. Weird. Also, the sex community, uh, sex committee, almost always, if not uh, always, you know, dudes. And only dudes. Noyce did believe that women had the right to choose if and when to bear a child, though which was not a common belief at the time. So, you know, John was a sexual predator and a feminist, which is a tough combo to pull off. Uh, The fourth major teaching practiced uh, there was called mutual criticism. This is that Elan school shit I mentioned. Uh, Mutual criticism established to assure the integrity of the community uh, by conformity to noise morality. uh, This was how it worked. A member under communal control would go before either committee or the whole community. 
They would, uh, you know, then criticize the person focusing on the member's bad traits, what the community thought was holding them back from contributing more positively to group culture. However, Noyce himself never went through this because he felt that a group should not criticize their leader. Otherwise, he totally would because he thinks it's great. He totally would. Uh, In addition to weird rules about sex and a policy of verbally abusing one another, there were also a lot of regulations. There were uh, 21 standing committees by the end, 48 administrative departments, covered every conceivable activity and interest from haircutting and dentistry to education to silk manufacturing. One super sad rule they had there uh, was uh, regarding child uh, care. Uh, At the age of 18 months, mothers would have to give up raising their toddlers and the kids would be basically raised in an orphanage within the community. Uh, They would know who their real parents were, but not get to live with them. Uh, Got to live in the same building, but not with them, not raised by them. Parents had to watch some compound nanny discipline their kids. Uh, Super fucked up. Lots of tears, I'm sure, with that one. Okay, now that we're, uh, we have a little lay of the land at Oneida, let's look closer to the life of one of the members, uh, Tizra Miller, to add a personal touch to all this. Because a lot of the Oneida community's records were destroyed, it wasn't until the publication of a young woman's diary entries in 1993, Tizra Miller, uh, Noyce's niece, that the full scope of the sexual situation at Oneida really came into public view. These diary entries published as a memoir titled Desire and Duty at Oneida, written between 1867 in 1879, when Tizra was between the ages of 23 and 36. Uh, she was born September 13th, 1843, back in Putney, Vermont. Her mom, Charlotte, the youngest sister of John Noyce, you know, founder of the community, uh, she was Don- John Humphrey's niece and his lover. She would have an interesting life, to say the least. She grew up in uh, the United community, moved there when she was five. Her family was uh, into that shit back in Vermont since, you know, before she was born. So she grew up accepting their beliefs completely. And this is how she described her childhood or a little moment of it. I was born September 13th, 1843 in Putney, Vermont. My mother was the youngest sister of John Noyes, the founder of the Oneida community. Mr. Noyes converted his two younger sisters and brother to his own peculiar views of religious and social life. And then having arranged their marriages with persons of similar views, he entered into cooperation with them, having common ownership of this world's goods and forming themselves into one large family with himself as the head. Uh, so that's interesting that he also arranged marriages, you know, too, before this. Uh, not sure if Noyes uh, fucked his sisters in Oneida, but he might have. Uh, he did, as you'll see, have no problem, you know, fucking his niece. Incest, apparently, did not interfere with the Jesus penis immortality electricity situation. Tizra continues, my first recollection of Mr. Noyes is when I was three years old. There was a lounge in the sitting room, all around the edge of which were pretty, uh, were pretty silk tassels of variegated colors. One day, one of these tassels was cut off and someone accused me of doing it. I did not do it, and of course, my denial must have been called in question, for my next remembrance is of being perched on Mr. Noyes's knee while he, with his arms folded, regarded me with a searching glance and told me to look him in the eye and tell him the truth. This was my first experience of fear of a human being and a, a fear of a human being, and a kind of terror seized me. But I do not recall any punishment, and the matter was soon passed by and forgotten by everyone but me. I remember Mr. Noyes afterwards as being very kind and gentle to the children. So creepy that he will uh, later have so much sex, you know, with her and other children he interacted with when they were very little. Uh, once Tizra made it to the age of 14, she was considered magnetic, which meant, you know, she was uh, considered to be attractive uh, to community men and meant her vagina was now an excellent conductor of Jesus' penis electricity. 14, that's so young. This is so fucked up, obviously. Although it's never written in any records, at least not ones we still have, it is very likely that her uncle John, 32 years her senior, initiated her into his system of complex marriage. They were lovers and confidence all the way up until Noyes would leave Oneida in 1879 when he was 68 and she was 36. Uh, even though Tizra grew up in a, at Oneida and was indoctrinated into this bullshit, she still found their practices uh, confusing. Probably because they were confusing because they were ridiculous. Uh, for example, in a diary entry from April of 1869, uh, Tizra recounted a conversation with Noyes where she told him that she had slept with men without any appetite and a great deal lately. Noyes replied that she must follow her own attractions. This is so confusing because if she did that, she'd probably pick the guy she liked the most and just fuck him. But then that would also be against, you know, Noyes' teachings. Uh, Tizra was greatly relieved when Noyes told her this, writing that she said, I have been in a kind of duty-doing spirit with folks for whom I had no attraction. I have felt that it was a great expense to me, but I didn't know what to do when I thought I was doing my duty. I'd hardly dared to hope I need to do nothing in this line, but felt an attraction for uh, for Tizra, as probably uh, was the case for many other community members, it was impossible to separate her own desires from the duty uh, to the community and from Noyes' various mandates because he'd built all these rules out of his own twisted desire just to have sex with Abigail Merwin, you know, uh, and probably just mental illness. The system, you know, I'm sure was just confusing for everyone. Follow your attractions, but don't just have sex with the person you're attracted to. 
And then when you do have sex, uh, d- don't let the guy finish. Uh, unless the committee has assigned him uh, to you for, for the breeding. But f- uh, follow your desires. But, but don't. Just have sex. Don't come. Just go for a while until... Um, how long would they have sex for, by the way? Until the guy's just blue balls felt like they were going to fucking pop. He's like, I, I can't take it anymore. It's enough. Uh, anyway, just, uh, just do what you want. Uh, whatever you want to do is perfect because it's uh, your will. God made it. But don't follow your will if it interferes with uh, the will that I've uh, described in the compound rules. And uh, just don't. Uh, if Chisra would have had her choice. She would have only pursued another member named James Herrick. One day she wrote while wearing a white dress that was his favorite. He calls me his little bride in it. She said, Tizra and Herrick were caught during a rainstorm in the community business office getting it on. Hey, Lucifina. She said there was a wonderful glow and ache between us. We seemed all aflame. We hurried to the house and then he wanted me to come into his room ecstasy. Fucking in the business office. Then fucking in the house. Uh, Passionately. There's no way he didn't come during those encounters. So, so sad that they just weren't encouraged to be together. On 1868, Tizza wrote about sleeping with another uncle. Oh, no, wait. This is the, the first uncle, Uncle John. Sleeping with Mr. Noise the other night, he said there was an immense difference in women in regard to power to please sexually. Why is there? Said I. Yes, he answered. There is as much difference between men in respect to ability to make social music as there is between a grand piano and a ten penny whistle. What the fuck? Then applying his remarks personally, he said, I always expect something sublime when I sleep with you. Dude was a real horn dog and a uh, uh, very, uh, you know, selfish lover, apparently. <laughs> Women are just better at it, right? You, you, you suck and you fuck with the, with the energy. I mean, guys, we'd love, to, we'd love to, but all we can do is just, you know, kind of lay there and let you do the work. And I don't know what the hell's going on here. Uh, April 1868, Tizzer references fucking her other uncle now. John's brother, George. She says, Uncle George has come and gone. Strange talk with him. We never talked so freely. He thought I troubled him some, bewitched him. We had it back and forth in lively style for a while. Okay. Then our talk was very satisfactory. We are no longer lovers. Anyway, I don't think I will trouble him in the least. I told him just what I owed to my acquaintance with him. He did me too. I don't know exactly what she's talking about there other than, you know, she had sex with him. In an 1869 entry, uh, Tisra talked about receiving that uh, community criticism. It seemed as though there was no action in my heart. Thursday the 19th, Theodore criticized me for not cooperating easily with him in regards to the paper for having a spirit of diotrephesis in regard to it, and for making Mary stand in terror of me. Aunt Harriet was there, said Theodore, she is full of diotrephian spirit lately. I don't see how it got into her. And Harriet said, I do. It is natural to her. That is where she is just like me. That spirit has always been natural to me. Uh, diotrephian is not a real word, by the way. It seems to be a reference to the biblical character of diotrephi- uh, diotrephes. A man mentioned only once in the book of Third John, this dude was said to be ambitious, proud, disrespectful of uh, apolistic or apolistic. God dang it. It's apostles. When you put it in that form, I always forget. Uh, apostolic, apostolic, I think. Apostolic. There we go. Authority, uh, rebellious, and more than anything, inhospitable. Uh, he tried to hinder these uh, those desiring to show hospi- hos- uh, hospitality to the brothers and to expel these from the congregation. So I have to assume that Tizra was being criticized for not being uh, you know, hospitable for being uh, inhospitable to fellow member Mary. Now, uh, she then wrote, I felt very thankful for the criticism. It softened my heart and did me good in many ways. Well, I'm glad her and Mayor Bear, you know, worked out their kerfluffle. Uh, April 6, 1869, she, uh, she talks uh, again about being criticized, this time right after sex. Writing, slept with John Humphrey Noyes, I dreaded to go because I knew he must discover my unmagnetic condition. He did fast enough. In the night, he said, would you like some criticism? <laughs> yes, I should very much. Well, there is no disguising the fact that you don't attract me. Ouch! You impress me with the feeling that your sexual nature has been abused by your entering into sexual intercourse without appetite. Spirits of men which are indigestible to you have come between you and me. It is true that I have slept with men without any appetite, she said, and a great deal lately. But why do you? He asked. I thought you promised me once you wouldn't. What the fuck is going on in this madhouse? Uh, sounds like he's mad at her for sleeping with other dudes, but if she won't do that, he'll be mad at her for not sharing her electricity. Uh, Tizra also wrote about being chosen by Noyes to start a, a sort of a eugenics experiment. Beginning in 1869, Noyes developed his idea to start selectively breeding community members so that their holiness would be imprinted on their babies on a cellular level. Science meets sex. That's fucking science. He went back to the chalkboard, right? He wrote some more numbers. He drew some more dicks and stuff to get it all right. Right? People with more Jesus magnet, immortality energy, glow stuff create babies with more Jesus volts in them. And if two parents are both supercharged, baby then has an immortality hemi burning inside of them. 
Noyce thought basically that if bred right, new members would have more Jesus immortality inside of them than anyone else. They'd have like a V8 immortality energy wean and lady wean instead of like a four-cylinder God energy genital or something. Uh, Tishra's first child, George Wallington Noyes, was fathered by her uncle, uh, George Noyes, you know, born in 1870. Cool, cool. Incest babies, you know, get to have new and improved God energy motors. Then she gives birth to Hayden Inslee, fathered by member Edward Inslee. In 1874. And then finally she gives birth to Hilda Herrick, father by the guy she actually liked the whole time, James Herrick, born in 1878. And then the community breaks up and she marries James, right? And then they have another kid, uh, Winifred Herrick, born in 1881. Uh, Tisra will die in 19... She'll been with him the whole time. Tisra will die in 1902, buried in the United Community Cemetery in Oneida, New York. Now, uh, her and James stuck around after the group Love Compound closed down and, you know, made some of that silverware money before she passed. Uh, back to the timeline for just a moment now. Uh, 1860, Charles Julius Guiteau joins the Oneida community. He will go on to become uh, their most infamous member for a reason that has nothing to do with uh, being part of this weird sex cult. Going to detour into one more member's life, and I I think it's worth it. Charles Julius Guiteau, born on September 8th, 1841 in Freeport, Freeport, Illinois, the fourth of six children of Luther Wilson Guiteau and Jane Howe. Jane had suffered from psychosis for much of her life, a mental condition involving a loss of contact with reality and difficulty with social interaction. And as Charles grew older, it appeared that he might have inherited some of his mother's mental illness. Uh, Jane died when Charles was only seven. Then Luther Guiteau remarried. Although he always tried to please his father, Charles uh, said a somewhat, was somewhat awkward, would often stammer, leading to painful beatings when he was unable to pronounce a word correctly or without a stutter. In addition, Luther would physically punish his son over what he perceived to be religious shortcomings. This Luther guy making me feel like one of the best fathers ever. I have made plenty of parental mistakes, but I have never beat my kids for not speaking correctly. Uh, As a youth, Charles Guiteau worked for his father, who was a businessman, uh, later elected county clerk, and then employed as a cashier in Freeport's Second National Bank. Luther Guiteau, uh, very much against sending his son to college. However, in 1859, an inheritance from his maternal grandfather provided Charles with the means to attend the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. But if Charles had been unhappy at home, more unhappy at school. For solace and direction, he turned to the religious doctrines of John Humphrey Noyce. Fuck yeah, bro, they connect. Uh, within a few months, he decided that his future was not at school, it was at the Oneida community. However, as enthusiastic as Gateau was about the prospect of practicing complex marriage, let's get it on! Uh, he found his options limited once he got there. Many of the young women not interested in him at all as a partner. That's got a sting. He was also not very enthusiastic about the idea of communism in general. Everyone was expected to help out with the most menial of tasks at the commune. Uh, Guiteau actually wrote Noyes a note after he'd been living in Oneida for a little while, explaining that he was sent there by God to help him. And therefore, he should not be expected to do any work that he personally found objectionable. That's fucking awesome. I bet Noyes did not care for that. Hey, that's my game. I'm the only one here who gets to claim crazy self-serving shit uh, that I say is actually prophecies from God. How dare you try and beat me in my own game? Uh, during many of the group criticism sessions, uh, Guiteau would repeatedly uh, was repeatedly called an egotist, accused of being conceited, feeling disrespected, uh, disrespected and insulted. He left the commune April 3rd, 1865, then settles in Hoboken, New Jersey. Attempts to start a paper there called the Daily Theocrat. And it doesn't last long because it sucks. Uh, on July 20th, 1865, he uh, wants to come back. He applies to re-enter Oneida and they accept him again. Seems like their admission standards pretty fucking low. Not long after his return, he starts complaining about the inability of others to see his true genius. Also, still nobody wants to fuck him. And, you know, since he's not part of Noise's inner circle of dick control wizards, Noise doesn't mandate anyone to fuck him. That must have hurt his ego, you know? He had to have uh, had been especially unfuckable, I feel like, not to get laid in Oneida. Uh, he should have fled out west, tried to track down those uh, battle axers, you know? Uh, get, get some action with those dirty pond fuckers. Uh, a year later, he leaves Oneida for good, sneaking out in the middle of the night. He could have just, you know, uh, walked out in broad daylight. No one was keeping him there, but he had a flair for the dramatic. And he was legitimately insane. By August of 1867, he has, uh, he's run out of money. He calls up his uh, brother-in-law, George Scoville, who's a lawyer. Uh, George offers Charles a job in his law office in Chicago, as well as a place to live. And after a few months, Charles quits his position, returns to New York to work for a newspaper called The Independent. But he doesn't like it, and he quits. And now he decides to sue Oneida. Uh, on the charge of withholding compensation for work he'd done there. Apparently, he forgot, uh, you know, one of the main principles of communism is not getting paid for your labor. For several months, Guiteau sends threatening letters to noise that amounts that amount to blackmail. Uh, Oneida lawyers write back and threaten to prosecute him for extortion, use his letters against him, and then he's like, aha, JK, I was, I was kidding around, I'll stop. He moves back to Chicago, 
where this highly unstable man manages to pass Illinois bar and set up a small private law office. That's cool. 1869, he marries Annie Bunn, a librarian to the local YMCA. It's not a happy marriage because he's crazy. Uh, his business is disorganized and failing. He's also abusive. Reportedly, uh, will do shit like lock her in a closet for, uh, you know, all night, stuff like that. Sounds like he's severely bipolar. You know, so sad that he just couldn't help medicate people with that illness back then. Uh, in 1874, his wife divorces him after she discovers he's visited a prostitute shortly after they had moved back to New York. Then the following year, or he moves back to New York, you know, might have been her first time. Then the following year, Guiteau's uh, behavior becomes more bizarre after failing to obtain the fun money for another newspaper venture, moves back in with his brother-in-law. Then one day, his sister, Francis, reports that, you know, he went out to chop wood. And when she's walking past him, he suddenly raises his axe at her in a threatening manner. She runs for the local doctor, who then comes back, examines her brother, and declares that he should be institutionalized. He doesn't want to be. So he runs away. He flees and becomes a minister for three years. Plot twist. From 1877 to 1880, Guiteau works as an itinerant preacher, writing and disseminating his own sermons, and then turns to politics. If you're seriously mentally unstable, maybe your best bet for steady work is religion or politics. Homeboy is a big Ulysses S. Grant fan, and he sets out for New York again to offer his services to the National Republican Committee. He writes a speech supporting Grant called uh, Grant Against Hancock, uh, Winfield uh, Hancock, uh, the Democratic nominee, and no one cares. Then when James Garfield is nominated, Guiteau decides he likes him more than he liked Grant. So he basically crosses out Grant's name in the speech and pencils in Garfield's name. Seriously. Then he delivers this speech to an audience of probably almost fucking no one. Uh, no one important heard it. Maybe some people trying to ignore him on a busy street corner or something. Then he gets copies of the speech printed, passes them around to members of the Republican National Committee, who I imagine throw them in the trash without reading them. Uh, when James Garfield wins the election, this, this guy's a nut. Uh, Guiteau actually thinks Garfield had him to thank the most. His, he thinks his speech won the election for him. So he packs up, <laughs> without ever talking to anybody at the White House, moves to Washington, D.C., expecting a government job to come his way any day now from a man who's never heard of him. Guiteau now, uh, once he gets to D.C., he writes the presiding secretary of state, William Everts, stating he would like to be appointed to a very important position once President-elect Garfield, you know, enters the White House. And what position did he want? He wants to be awarded the position of consul to Austria as a personal tribute for his campaign efforts, which, you know, apparently were like so minimal. Uh, but then before anybody wrote back, he uh, writes another letter. He changes his mind. He decides, you know what? Paris is going to be a better fit for me. Yes, give me Paris. I'm very important. <laughs> then after moving into a Washington uh, boarding house on March 10th, 1881, uh, Guiteau randomly shows up at the White House asking to see the president back when you could do that shit. And in a move that definitely would not happen again today, he gets to meet the president. He actually, he actually gets to enter the executive office, hands the president a copy of his Garfield against Hancock pamphlet, I like to actually picture it with actually the name of Grant crossed out and then, you know, Garfield. And also he wrote the words Paris consulship on the front. Like, that's what I want in exchange for this. After declaring that he was an applicant for the position, he takes a seat while the president starts to quietly read the document, probably nervously. What's this guy doing here? And then several minutes later, he just inexplicably gets up and fucking leaves without speaking another word. Just walks the fuck out on the president who agreed to meet him. Next day, he writes the new secretary of state, James Blaine, claiming that he had spoken to Garfield and the president had said which he didn't, an endorsement would help as it was in your department. Uh, he informed Blaine that his speech got Garfield, that's what fucking got in the presidency was my speech. And now he just keeps writing Blaine over and over, you know, uh, every few days, sometimes multiple times in a day, more nonsense. For some reason, the Secret Service, which did exist back then, does not have him quietly killed like they probably should have. Uh, Guiteau next shows up at a White House reception or soon shows up at a White House reception, uh, introduces himself to Lucretia Garfield, president's wife tells her he's one of the men that made Mr. Garfield president. And I bet his eyes weren't crazy at all when he said that. Also approach Indiana Senator Benjamin Harrison, who would later become the 23rd pre president, asked him if, uh, you know, Harrison could intervene on his behalf, get him this job. Harrison politely declines. Probably he's like, keep an eye on this guy, just secret service. At the end of March, Guiteau makes a personal visit to Blaine at the State Department, hands the secretary his fucking stupid speech again. <laughs> Finally, on May 14th, Secretary Blaine's had enough. Uh, never speak to me again on the subject of Paris. He snaps when Gateau asks if there's anything new to report. And Gateau gets mad and says, I'm going to see the president about this. And they're like, no, you're not. Uh, Gateau hurries back to his boarding house, quickly dashes off a letter to the president telling him about Blaine's behavior. I'm sure they threw in the trash. Well, actually they didn't because uh, it's documented. Uh, he wrote that he had previously considered Blaine a friend, was therefore confused. Nine days later, he writes to Garfield again with the demand that Blaine be dismissed or otherwise you and the Republican Party will come to grief. Now the Secret Service should have definitely had him quietly killed. I mean, come on. Then informs the president that he will be stopping by the following day. The president's private secretary, 
uh, you know, however, had already issued orders to the White House ushers to make sure he is never fucking let into the White House again. Uh, for the next few weeks, now Gato prays for divine guidance about what to do. And his prayers are answered. God tells him he has to kill the president in order to restore peace between various factions in the Republican Party. Right? Please, God, just tell me, just tell me what to do. You know, I'm sure this, I'm sure this happened. Kill him, Charles. Kill the president for not getting back to you about Paris. I mean, you gave him the presidency with your awesome speech. Uh, before killing the president, Gateau also decides to publish a religious manuscript. Because why not? Uh, the book he wrote was called The Truth, The Companion to the Bible, which was actually not a book he wrote. It was a plagiarized uh, book of John Humphrey Noyes' writings. Great minds think alike. He orders 1,000 copies printed, then attempts to sell them on the streets of Boston, but no one fucking wants him. So he snaps, you know, a little further. He returns to Washington, buys a gun, and on July 2nd, 1821, Charles Gateau shoots President Garfield twice. Shoots him once in the arm, then fatally in the back as the president was about to depart from the Baltimore and uh, Potomac Railroad Station. The president would die from his wounds 11 weeks later. Slow death from these wounds. Seeing the president off the uh, morning he died was Secretary of War Robert Todd Lincoln, son of assassination victim Abraham Lincoln. As Garfield lay on the ground bleeding after being shot, Guiteau headed toward the exit on 6th Street. He's promptly arrested. His trial would begin November 14th, 1881, would end May 22nd, 1882. And throughout his trial, uh, he exhibited bizarre behavior. That gave credence to the defense team's contention that, you know, he's crazy. He cursed and insulted everyone in the courtroom, including his own attorney, who happened to be his sister's husband, that George Scoville again, also the judge himself, at times even passed notes to spectators in the courtroom asking for their advice on how to proceed. That's so funny to me. Um, imagine being in court, sitting behind some murder, right? And then he just turns and passes you a note and you open up and just says, what do you, what do you think I should do? What, you, what would you do? Uh, Charles was found guilty on January 25th, 1882 uh, Then called the jury low consummate jackasses uh, Said that God will avenge his outrage Proclaimed to the judge I am not guilty of the charge set forth in the indictment It was God's act and not mine God will take care of it And God, I, I don't know, I guess took care of it uh, Charles was hanged at the District of Columbia Jail Two days before the first anniversary of the assassination And that dude Was accepted not once but twice Into the Oneida community Hope you found that detour uh, interesting and worthwhile. All right, now back to the main uh, timeline. June 1879, one of Noyes' most loyal followers alerts him that he's about to be arrested for statutory rape, right? About to get in trouble again. So in the middle of the night, he flees again. He knows that he's guilty and he takes off for uh, Ontario, Canada. In August, he writes back to the United Group stating that it was time to abandon the practice of complex marriage and live in a more traditional manner. He knew if he didn't, more charges against other group members were coming and the whole thing would get shut down. Uh, weird how a sudden fear of incarceration completely and immediately changed God's plans for humanity. Uh, then the United Community formally dissolves and converts to a joint stock company. January 1st, 1881. One of the earliest joint stock companies uh, in the U.S. Members of the former United Community now all become shareholders of what is going to quickly become a very valuable corporation. that will go on to become very wealthy, making a lot of silverware money. All that group sex did not lead to immortality, but it did lead to a nice fat IPO. How fucking weird. More on their cutlery in a bit. Uh, Noise would never return to the U.S., but he did retain a powerful influence over many of his followers. Uh, some even left Oneida to come to the Niagara Falls area. Not sure if he kept sleep with them, but I'm going to guess, uh, yeah, he did. Probably did. Uh, John Humphrey Noyes then dies just a few years later, Niagara Falls, Ontario, April 13th, 1886, at the age of 74. How did he die? Well, the rumor is... But after 40 years of so much sex, but not coming, when he finally ejaculated, he blew the top of his dick off. And he, uh, and he bled out. Uh, for real though, how did he die? He passed away quietly in his sleep. Uh, his body was returned to Oneida, buried in the United Community Cemetery with those of many of his followers where it remains today. Dude never pulled off his Jesus energy dick wizard immortality experiment. I wonder what his spirit is up to now, right? His spirit, if it exists. Hopefully has not been able to track down the spirit of Abigail Merwin. If it has, holy shit, is she getting ghost fucked right now? Ah, her poor ghost puss must be so sore. Uh, for the next few decades, the joint stock company kept selling all kinds of things. Steel traps, silk clothes, canned vegetables, leather handbags, etc. Right, uh, and the people running things, still crazy. Early heads of the community still believed in versions of noises, perfectionism, still likely dabbled in, you know, polyamory uh, and claimed to be visited by the spirit of noise who helped them lead the company. So that's cool. Finally, in 1899, the United Community starts a uh, production of silver-plated flatware and hollowware using the community plate mark. And they started focusing uh, more on uh, more uh, flatware going forward. The animal trap business is sold in 1912. Silk business, get rid of it in 1916. Canning business, uh, they got rid of that in 1915. 
1929, Oneida started producing a somewhat lower quality line of products. In addition to their expensive shit, sales go even better. 1935, Oneida changed its name to Oneida Limited. And the company becomes one of the largest producers of flour in the entire world for most of the 20th century. Uh, In 1950, the last original member of the Oneida community, Ella Florence Underwood, dies at the age of 101. Uh, Kentwood, New York. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure left a huge silver money inheritance to her descendants. Uh, by the 1980s, Oneida, Oneida made at least half of all flatware purchased in the U.S. Most of you listening right now have undoubtedly eaten something using Oneida cutlery, possibly today. And one of my favorite pieces of trivia from this, you know the term spooning? I'm sure you know uh, the term spooning, pretty common. Uh, the term spooning as in laying behind someone, each of you on your side facing the same direction, crotch against butt, that comes from Oneida. When people found out about their, you know, wild sexual past, sex mixed with silverware and the term spooning was born. A nod, of course, to, uh, you know, slow sex due to that history of not coming and all that. I did not know that. Did you know that? Did you believe that? Even for a second, because it's not true. If you did, I'm going to tell my wife, Lindsay, the queen of the suck is going to be very happy. Uh, when I told her about this crazy story over lunch the other day, uh, she said that I should uh, tell that story. She wanted to see if anybody would fall for it. She'll be so happy if you did. A few decades ago, cheap silverware being readily available begins to cripple Oneida's business model. Uh, Oneida Limited goes bankrupt in 2006, sold uh, to a multinational company. It remains today as the company Oneida, a silverware company that claims to aim for perfection, like the community that created it, but hopefully less 14-year-old fucking. And uh, with that, let's hop out of this Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. The Oneida community. What another wild cult tale. Uh, before I recap and share some thoughts, uh, how about one more sponsor? I, I think you're going to like this one. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by the world's soon to be number one phone sex hotline, 1 900 Pond Fuck. Call one of our sexy men or ladies who are waiting right now out behind the barn, down that muddy hill, naked, filthy, fucking each other's brains out in a nasty-ass pond. Are they going to let being covered in chicken and cow shit keep them from plugging every dirty hole? Hell no. Is that pond filled with leeches and tadpoles and stuff? Yup, they're invited too. Everyone and everything can come to the pond fuck. So call 1-900-POND-FUCK and for just $3.99 a minute, you can swim on in. Is that some pond puss you're feeling down in that dark, dirty water? Or is that a muskrat? Who cares? Muskrats need love too. Everyone gets love in the fuck pond. No clothes, no cares, lots of frogs. Quite a bit of bacteria. Maybe some dysentery. Definitely a lot of butts and front butts and titties. Lady titties. Man titties. Maybe even some goat, cow, and dog titties. No one gets denied in the fuck pond. Wade in, feel around, stick it in, or get it stuck in. And then maybe take some antibiotics, because we don't want anyone dying in the fuck pond. But if you do die, probably from an infection. The party don't stop, won't stop. 1-900-POND-FUCK. Just $3.99 a minute, get wet, get dirty, get pond fucked. Uh, man, what a great sponsor. I'm, you know, I gotta say, I'm really proud to have such quality companies aligning with the suck. It's, uh, it's great. It makes me feel good. Uh, now I feel ready. Now I feel recharged to recap. Uh, founded by John Humphrey Noyes after his first experiment, the, the Putney community was driven out of Vermont in 1848. The Oneida community existed for three decades with uh, up to just over 300 members at its height. Members spun silk, canned fruits and vegetables, made animal traps, got yelled at by each other, fucked each other to create enough God energy to become immortal and more. Well, to try to become immortal. Didn't quite work. Led by noise, they aimed for perfection, an idea noise became obsessed with while studying at the Theological Seminary in Yale. And eventually, uh, you know, getting his preaching license revoked for his claim that he was literally perfect, entirely without sin. After noise fled to Canada many years later, following a tip that he'd be arrested for statutory rape, the community he founded dissolved, formally becoming a joint stock corporation in 1881, then transitioned into a silverware company by the end of the 19th century, becoming America's biggest silverware manufacturer. One of the largest flatware producers in the world by the end of the 20th century. Such a fascinating piece of history. And I would have never heard about it if not for the show. Once again, I am so fascinated by how wild some people's lives have been. Once again, I wonder what similar cult might be lurking somewhere around me right now. There's a huge property. 
about a mile from uh from me up on this uh mountain uh you know not not far from the stock dungeon i checked out google satellite photos of it a while back it's massive several large buildings it could be uh for sure compounds large high fence surrounds it a fence you can't see through a big security gate at the entrance the grounds uh you know uh apparently from the satellite photos i was able to see seem kind of manicured like little mini golf course there just all kinds of stuff and i have no idea what goes on there there's probably a property like that somewhere near you. Some secret defense in place. Maybe some place people whisper about. I definitely see people around this area from time to time. Adults piling out of a van all dressed alike. Like they fucking time traveled here from the 19th century, for example. And I don't know what they're about, right? I don't know what's going on. Are they living on a compound? Are they, are they you know, asked to fuck each other to create Jesus immortality juice? With conspiracy culture on the rise right now, probably not going to go away anytime soon. There has to be a new wave of so many crazy cults coming, right? There's around 8 billion meat sacks on earth right now. How many of them are doing shit just as weird as John Humphrey Noyes and his followers were doing over 150 years ago? Well, I guess less than 150 years ago by the very end. Uh, 10,000, 100,000, millions. I feel terrible for the people who get sucked into the shit, you know, when they're super young or super desperate. They're maybe born into it, just born gullible. But the stories produced by this stuff, oh God, man, do they make life more interesting. Stay curious, meat sacks. Stay interested in all the wild and wacky shit that goes on around you every damn day. We can't stop all this stuff from happening, so we might as well enjoy learning about it when it does. Uh, let's revisit what fascinating stuff we learned today in today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the Oneida community was potentially the most successful utopian socialist project in the U.S. ever. Last from 1848 to 1879. Hundreds of members living, working, fucking on the upstate New York farm slash compound. Number two, John Humphrey Noyes had a lot of interesting views to say the least after chasing after a woman who didn't want him. He developed an idea that she was still his spiritual bride. And then he developed, uh, you know, the idea of a complex marriage, meaning all men were married to all women. One way or another, right, in life or in death, most of today's insanity was developed out of John's desire to fuck poor Abigail Merwin. Number three, the United community was briefly the home of Charles Guiteau, who would later go on to attempt to sue them for unpaid labor, apparently forgetting that uh, that was the whole idea of utopian socialism. Uh, then Guiteau would convince himself that he was the reason James Garfield got reelected or got elected to the presidency, excuse me. Then he'd badger members of Garfield's staff for months before shooting the president at a train station. And this now was admitted to the United community not once but twice, which further illustrates how crazy this place was. Number four, just don't come. Noise taught followers the practice of male continence, a fancy term for not ejaculating, because the most important function of sex was not to have kids. It was to create some kind of magnetic Jesus juice power conductor that would energize the human race into immortality. And wasting your cum was wasting some of that energy. Uh, number five, new info. Today, the legacy of this cult lives on in the Oneida Community Mansion House, where guests can stay overnight and visit the museum. A few descendants of the original community still live today in this mansion where so much weird fucking and group criticism and weird dick control training and stuff went on. Many of the followers of John Humphrey Noyes buried in the United Cemetery uh, next to the, the mansion, the old cult compound, now a museum, has permanent residence apartments, and is a bed and breakfast. Uh, you can stay for the night or for the rest of your life, uh, where all this weird shit went down. You can go to oneidacommunity.org if you want to book your stay, and please do not tell them I've sent you, because I do not want them to hear this podcast and write me a bunch of hateful shit. And that's all for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Oneida community cult has been sucked. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all their help in making time suck every week. Thank you to Sophie Evans, the fact sorceress, for doing a great job with the initial research on this one. Thanks to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, for giving me the time to do a lot of additional research and record it. Thanks to Joe Pesey for production. Reverend Doctor, making it sound so good in here. I'm liking it uh, more and more, this new little uh, revamp. Uh, thanks to you for continuing to rate and review and spread the suck to new members by word of mouth, more effective than any other form of advertising. Uh, thanks to Bit Elixir for keeping the Time Suck app running smooth. Logan the Art Warlock Keith, creating all the merch at badmagicmerch.com. Uh, also running socials with Liz Enchantress Hernandez, who also runs our Cult of the Curious Facebook 2 private Facebook page, along with her wonderful all seen eyes moderators. Thank you, Liz. Thanks to Beefsteak and his mod squad, keeping all those meat sacks happy over on Discord. Next week, it is Celtic mythology. The space lizards have spoken, voted to add to our collection of mythological sucks from around the globe. This time, we're going to head to Ireland and uh, five other Celtic nations to suck on some crazy-ass gods, monsters, fairies, leprechauns. Here's some very unique folk tales. Head to the Emerald, Emerald Isle, 
uh, to learn about the possible origins of the Celtic people, a bit of history about Ireland, its ancient language, and about some interesting mythological heroes and characters like uh, one uh, Fegan or Finn McCool. Mr. McCool, great hero name. We'll also look at how the Celtic storyteller tradition translated into uh, some of the most groundbreaking and influential writers of the last few hundred years. Ireland's a beautiful little island with only a few million people pumped out a lot of the literary, wor- literary world's biggest names. James Joyce, Oscar Wilde, C.S. Lewis, Bram Stoker, Samuel Beckett, and more. Uh, join us next week as we suck the shit out of the weird uh, shit that Celtic people have been saying to each other for hundreds and hundreds of years. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. Uh, let's start with some laughs. Managing meat sack James Ebby got Cummins lot. He writes, God damn it, you mother of all fucking suckers. I'd gone for such a long time without any issues. I've been super careful because I heard during all the updates, all the times people got Cummins lot. I was told myself that it wouldn't happen to me. I was so careful to always be aware of my surroundings and had OCD levels of making sure that if my Bluetooth fails, I would not, it would not result in anyone around me hearing it. Was still trying to get caught up on the backlog and not looking for sympathy, sympathy, excuse me. But uh, recently, uh, the family and I had been having a really hard, you know, last, last six months. It's caused me to be less careful, I guess, because it happened to me. I was listening and your first Whipple ad started while I was supposed to be waiting for 15 more minutes in a curbside pickup spot. I was laughing so hard that my eyes closed. I was having actual tears fall. When I opened my eyes again, there she was. The poor girl got to hear, fuck you, fuck your family, Whipple. Uh, as I went super pale in, uh, <laughs> in fear, time seemed to stand still as I frantically tried to stop the suck from playing over the car stereo. She smiled, asked what I was listening to, told her about Time Suck, warned her about it, warned her about it being irreverent humor, which she got a good taste of thanks to me. And I guess you as well. Uh, <laughs> hopefully she tries out Time Suck, maybe even becomes a space lizard as well. It's uh, what I tell myself to make myself feel better. I hope that you're proud of what you've done. Thanks so much for all that you do and the Suck Dungeon family do to keep our spirits up and add goodness to our lives. If you end up reading this out loud uh, and are up to doing a shout out, can you shout out the kitchen crew that I'm lucky to be the manager of? The People's Kitchen. They'll get it. Thanks again, Dan. All hail the people's kitchen. Well, thank you, James, for sending such a sweet and funny message. So glad you're having fun with all this uh, wild content. And uh, sorry, you and the fam have had some recent struggles. Uh, hope work is good at whatever kind of fucking commie bullshit restaurant you know, you're working at. People's kitchen. Sounds like, a, uh, sounds like a front for Chinese spies. I picture a mural of uh, Mao Zedong on one of the walls or something. And now, now I'm craving orange chicken. I just had some from Chinatown restaurant here in CDA a few days ago. They've been around for a while. Uh, didn't realize how good they are. My God, they're fucking excellent. New favorite Chinese restaurant spot. Uh, what am I talking about? Hail Nimrod, James. Now quick and funny prostitution update of sorts from uh, surrounded by sex workers, sucker, Samantha Lewis. She writes, hello to the suck lore. Just in case you wanted to learn more about the brothels of Nevada, here I am. Not only is there one in Sparks, Nevada, there's four more in Mound House, Nevada, right outside of Carson City. I've lived here in Dayton, another small town no one knows or cares about my entire 22 years of life. Not once have I thought about how weird it is to live next to brothels. That's probably just because I used to think that the Bunny Ranch was actually where bunnies were raised and sold. Don't judge my nine-year-old self too much. Why well, I love that your nine-year-old self thought, thought that. Another thing, the original owner that uh, owned several brothels in Nevada, Dennis Hoff, passed away in 2018. Honestly, the guy looked like he was probably a pimp before that. Now, if you come down to the visit the Bunny Ranch and get your ween played with, you can also go buy an eighth and a gun at pretty much the same time. The three buildings are all within walking distance from each other. It's fantastic. Uh, anyways, have a fun ass 2022. Hopefully I'll get to come see your ass at one of your shows this year. Samantha, weed, ween playing, guns. What could go wrong with that trifecta? That sounds like a great Friday night. I uh, hope to see you at a show and hope life is great in Dayton. Uh, so close to Carson City, right? You, you have plenty to do. Uh, don't blow all your money on gambling. Uh, maybe blow it at the Bunny Ranch instead. Uh, now for a quick uh, Got Cummins Law twice in one day message. Elderly lover, Heather, Heather Manley. <laughs> She's not elderly. She just loves the elderly. You'll see. Dear Master Sucker, I'm a newish recruit to, to the suck and I started at the beginning. So I just recently finished the Joan of Arc suck and I got double did while listening. I went through a drive through for lunch while I had the suck playing through my car. Uh, well, I didn't pause. And right as I went to pay, an old man working, um, uh, here's your clean ween sponsor ad playing saying, if you want a clean penis, uh, you're getting yelled right through my car. Damn, I can never go back there again. The old man thinks I'm some kind of crazy perf. Then after work, I volunteer to drive an elderly client home. She gets in my car and the suck automatically starts to play and here are you yelling, fucker! <laughs> right at my 87-year-old passenger. Luckily, she laughed and said, don't worry, sweetheart. I grew up in Brooklyn. 
Ah, double did. Thought you might enjoy this. Keep on sucking, scaring, making fun of dumb. Love them all. Heather in Denver. Thank you, Heather. I'm so glad you're having fun with all this. And tell that Brooklyn hottie you were riding with that I love her. She sounds fucking awesome. Right? And be more careful with the show going forward. Today's episode, oh, it could, it could get you in some real trouble. Now for another sex worker update. Uh, a real life Lucifina who wants to stay anonymous writes, Hey Dan, it's me again. Uh, here to tell you about another portion of my short but crazy life. I fell into financial hardship, briefly ended up as a sex worker through a friend of a friend that had been doing it for about seven years. I've had past sexual trauma and despite the sexual healing I got from my ex-boyfriend, a fellow cult member and good friend, I overall had trouble being comfortable with sex. It was something I was hesitant to do, but was surprised. Depending on what they wanted, clients paid $200 to $400 for an hour-long session that often only took 15 minutes. I easily made $1,000 a day, barely gave up three hours of my time. There was no pimp. I only did things I was comfortable with, only undressed to my level of comfort, only saw the clients I wanted to, and they all treated me like a goddess. Services ranged from just talking to massage to happy endings or full service if I was okay with it. My first client who became a regular paid to give me a massage. I only ever felt uncomfortable once, and he left when I told him to, paid me, and was blacklisted. Contrary to the popular narrative, I felt like I was taking advantage of these rich men, not the other way around. I know people's experiences with sex work differ and there is a very dark side, but my experience was surprisingly pleasant and I've had worse dates. My time as a sex worker actually made me feel like I got my power back. It gave me confidence and allowed me to be more open about sex with my current partner. I'm able to enjoy sex more than I ever have and I never thought that would be a byproduct. Sorry for the long email. Please leave my name out if you read this on the podcast. Hail Lucifina and hail Bojangles. Well, I'm so glad uh, to hear that you had such a positive experience. That's, That's best case scenario, right? Uh, I wish I could get someone to, to pay me for giving me a massage. That's a fucking sweet ass Jedi mind trick. Uh, the topic of sex work, right? So multifaceted, uh, so different for every person. Uh, thanks for sharing your personal story and possibly, probably making others more comfortable with whatever, you know, their similar story might be. Nimrod loves you. Thanks for taking, uh, you know, some more shame and stigma out of it, out of that, uh, you know, area. And, and one more update from a super special sucker, Hayden Nelson. Uh, Hayden writes, Hi, my name is Hayden Nelson, and you guys recently spoke to my parents in Loveland, Colorado, Steve and Tamara. Uh, yeah, they're lovely. Uh, I'm the one that received the poster that you signed. I was told they told you a little bit about me, but I wanted to write in, give you the whole story as to why this community means so much to me. I actually do apologize for the length of this email. I'm going to be long, and uh, I'm grateful if you take the time to read it. As a kid, I was diagnosed with severe ADHD and autism. Due to this, I was a hyperactive maniac that did not understand social cues, which led to me being aggressively bullied. As I got older, I became more reserved. I became homeschooled and stopped having friends. I spent time with my family, focused on my academics. I also grew up in a Mormon community, St. George, Utah, and was shunned by a large portion of the neighborhood when I left the church. I wanted to paint this picture because I never really felt like I had a group to belong to growing up outside of my family. When I turned 16, we moved to Loveland. I was now older and more mature and determined to find a place in the world. Rewinding a couple of years, I already knew about Dan because I had been listening to his comedy. I listened to comedy constantly because I don't understand humor naturally, and I had to learn what was funny. Uh, or I didn't understand humor naturally. Uh, through listening to Dan and others like him, I developed the fucked, <laughs> the fucked dark sense of humor I have today. Jumping back to Colorado, uh, me and my mom, what are you talking, what are you talking about weird, color, weird humor? What, what weird humor? Come on. Get in the pond and fuck, buddy. Uh. But anyway, jumping back to Colorado, me and my mom, who showed me uh, Dan's comedy originally. Yeah, mom's awesome. Are driving to go skiing. We stumbled upon Time Suck, and we were immediately intrigued and loved the first few episodes we listened to. However, my mom doesn't like some of the darker subjects and will not listen to any of the serial killers. Uh, Yeah, I get it. Uh, I, on the other hand, listened to everything, and I had a job with a lot of free time. I quickly began binging episodes. I loved learning. But what what I liked more was the community that was forming around the podcast. People from all backgrounds who loved to learn and had horrifying senses of humor. I had found my group. Around this time, I also developed generalized anxiety. I became very depressed. I struggled to stop thinking and calm down, and Time Suck provided an escape from dark thoughts. I could tune in, learn with the community uh, that even though I had never met anyone from, I felt accepted by. Fast forward again, I'm 17. I'm moving to Salt Lake City with my mom so she can attend the University of Utah Law School. Once again, I find myself in a new place with zero friends, but I still have Time Suck. Shortly after moving, my mental health uh, hit an all-time low. One night as I was driving home from work, my anxiety was kicking my ass as I listened to the end of the time of a time suck. And as I was listening to an update, uh, an update, or uh, sorry. And as I was listening, an update came through from a meat sack offering words of encouragement to anyone struggling with their demons. I'm not ashamed to admit that I began to sob in my car 
It was a message from the only group I had at the time. Uh, a couple weeks later, ah, oh, man, you get me. <sighs> A couple weeks later, I got the acceptance letter to the University of Utah. Then COVID hit. Uh, I was 18 working at Best Buy. And because my mom is very immunocompromised, I had to move out. Uh, this came with its own set of worries, difficulties. But thanks to my family and the Bad Magic community, I made it to the start of my first semester when a letter arrived in the mail informing me I was receiving a full ride for four years. It's fucking awesome. Uh, by this time, I also listened to Is We Dumb and Scared to Death Religiously. During my first year of college, I struggled. I was totally isolated, overwhelmed, financially responsible for myself. Again, I was able to find solace in the Bad Magic community on Discord, Facebook. I'd find myself fist pump in the air as Dan read Time Sucker updates. Now here I am, 20 years old, having just finished my third semester, wanting to say thank you. Last night, I found a pond with some like-minded individuals. And we fucked in sucked all night and all. Sorry, why did I do that? Uh, thank you, Bad Magic, for being there any hour I needed a break from my life. Thank you for all the hard work that everyone does to make these podcasts each week, because they mean more to some people than you can even imagine. I know it's weird to care so much about a weekly podcast hosted by people you've never met, uh, before, but the world's a weird fucking place. It sure is. Choosing to miss your show in Loveland was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made. Fuck calculus. And I hope I get to meet both of you in the future, but I wanted to at least make sure you knew how thankful I am to you and your team. Bad Magician and Bojangles Chew Toy, Hayden. P.S. If for some reason you read this novel on air, feel free to use my name. P.P.S. The day you killed Pootie and Juju, you killed a piece of my soul. The best character Time Sucks ever had. I need to come back. Well, Hayden, what a wonderful message. And uh, what a better real life story. Uh, Lindsay Bald, when she first read it, uh, I clearly yeah, got a little uh, allergies. I, uh, a lot of pollen came into the studio, part of that. You made the right choice, uh, by the way, skip my show. School more important than my stand up any day. Good on you. And Pootie and Juju, uh, not dead. They're, they're missing currently. They're in the, you know what? They're in the pond. <laughs> too little, too little, Pootie. I feel something touching my front butt. No, something's good. I'll find them. I'll keep looking for them. Uh, I'm so glad you found a sense of community here. Truly uh, warms my uh, sometimes dark heart. And, uh, and I'd like you, you know what? I'd like you to come live my new compound. I've decided John Noyes was right about everything. And I need, I need more energy fuckers that I can count on so I can live forever. Uh, but seriously though, I hope you thrive in school. I hope you can always return to these episodes when you need them. I hope you know that you're a beautiful soul and the universe fucking loves you. Your parents are both incredible. Uh, good energy from, from both of them. Uh, you have good guides. And, uh, last thing, uh, don't come ever. Don't ever come. It fucks up your magnet energy and you might get sick. You know, you might flunk out of school if you come. I'm sorry. I'm confused about a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, after hearing today's episode, I love you, buddy. Hail Nimrod. And, uh, that is all for today's time sucker updates. Thanks time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thank you again for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meat Sacks. Uh, go ahead and come this week as much as you want and keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Hey, Dan. Yeah. Uh, we're done recording. What are you doing there? <laughs> I'm trying to save us and let us all live forever by creating magic Jesus energy. But what do you, like, what is that you're putting your fingers in right there? It's <laughs> obviously a pretend horse puss that I am pretty sure counts. I'm kind of feeling the energy, but isn't there, there's an asshole in that thing, right? Oh. There you go. That's how you get the energy up. There you go, buddy.